Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the D and What If, with another fanfiction. This is the first part of What If Deku was the Vigilante Green Cherub. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Summary. Izuki gets abandoned and has to go through the foster care system but when that doesn't go well he fends for himself and turns badass. Eraserhead adopts another child. Izuku is also a little morally gray cause why be nice to those who have never been nice to you. Ike I am bad at summarizing. I did try to keep this realistic with Izuku actually taking time to train before becoming a vigilante and it taking time for Aizawa to gain his trust. This will be a longer fic. Italics mean thought btw. Notes. This honestly has a lot of trigger warnings and they apply to very chapter so I will probably write them here and if the chapter really needs it I will put them again otherwise you have been warned. The trigger warnings include abuse, neglect, bullying, self-harm, bullying, suicidal thoughts, suicide baiting, violence, self-deprecation, and panic attacks. I am pro forgetting some I will list the trigger warnings for the chapter and if you feel the need to skip I will have a chapter summary in the bottom note on the bad chapters. I honestly have no idea what I am doing and I don't have a chapter plan so I don't have a set number and there isn't a set ending or anything yet I have an idea but at the same time I am lost. I will put out a few chapters out at a time and I am gonna try to get this done quickly before I forget about it. This is a long fic and is going to go slowly with a more realistic timeline so no Izuku being a master fighter in a week. I hope you enjoy it have a fun time. Chapter 1 The Beginning Chapter Text I'm tired. I can't keep dealing with this discrimination you bring. I am tired of being ostracized for having a quirkless son so I am disowning you. This will probably come as no surprise to you. CPS is coming to pick you up. They are outside. Please don't come back. I am sorry I truly am. And Ko says through the barely open door. He had just come home from school. Lining the hallway outside of the apartment are his things his stuff all labeled. Through the fuzz in his head he thinks he hears the door close and lock. An envelope sits on top of a trash bag. He opens the envelope inside is his birth certificate, social security number, his citizenship certificate, his hospital record and his mother plus father's health history. Official document saying and co disowned her son and 300,000 yen. Looking at the boxes he sees three boxes for his All Might merch, one box for bedding, one box for winter clothes and then the trash bag he assumes is his summer clothes. How could she do this? His mind was fuzz and he felt numb like a robot it was like he was above his body looking down and watching someone else's life. And Ko had not been cruel but she hadn't been nice either. Izuku barely saw her at the apartment most of the time she only came to eat and sleep. She kept the pantry and fridge stocked enough for dinner since lunch and breakfast he could have at school. She even paid for school stuff usually leaving an envelope with enough money for a uniform and supplies. It had been a while since he had called her mom or even talked to her but this hurt more than he realized it would. And Ko had slowly started icing him out so this was expected. That didn't mean it didn't hurt. A man in a suit tapped his shoulder making Izuku jump and yelp he turned. Hello I am Kenzo Watanabe. I am your social worker I will be homing you. For the time being you will be living in a group home until I can find a foster home for you. You can bring three boxes that's it. There isn't enough room for more. I will not be helping you bring it to the car. Mr. Watanabe said before walking back towards the stairs. Izuku decided to grab the box for bedding. The box of winter clothes and the bag of summer clothes. He slipped the envelope from his mother into his school bag that was on his back. He hoped Mr. Watanabe didn't include the backpack in the box statement. He made two trips down to the car putting everything in the car trunk. He was still out of it it hadn't hit him until Mr. Watanabe started driving away with Izuku in the back of the car. He stared out the window tears filling his eyes and then trickling down his face. She abandoned me. I am alone. I am ten and quirkless what family will take me? Why me? Why me? Why me? Why me? Why me? What did I do to deserve this? A sniffle and a small sob escaped him as they left his street and he was now really leaving home as they went deeper into the red light district. Arriving 25 minutes later at a big building that resembled a school in some ways the car stopped. An older woman with graying hair, pinkish skin and tentacles for fingers came out the front door and approached the car. Mr. Watanabe got out and greeted the woman he handed her a file and started talking to the woman while gesturing to the car. Izuku tried to dry the tears he didn't want to look weak. Mr. Watanabe opened Izuka's door and introduced him to the woman who he found out was the person running the group home. Midoriya this is Hana Kubo you may address her as Mrs. Kubo. Mr. Watanabe turned to Izuku and said I expect you to treat her with the utmost respect. You will most likely be living here for a while since it will be hard to find a home for you. I will check I will check in with you soon. Mr. Watanabe opened the trunk and helped Izuku get his things from the back. Once all of his things were out of the trunk Mr. Watanabe bowed to Mrs. Kubo and then got into his car and drove off. 
Izuku watched his car pull onto the street then turned to Mrs. Kubo. As Mr. Watanabe said my name is Hana Kubo. You will address me as Mrs. Kubo or ma'am. We will walk and talk grab your stuff. I will only explain once. She said as she grabbed on box then started walking away. Izuku scrambled to grab the rest of his stuff and hurried to catch up to her. She held open the door for him then continued talking we house 25 kids here all are two to a room. You will be given a bed, sheets, blanket and pillow. You have one bookshelf for your stuff and a small dresser for your clothes. There is a storage room that you can put anything else in. Your roommate will show it to you. We provide only dinner during the school year and then breakfast and dinner during breaks. We will help with school supplies and uniforms. There are three caretakers me, Mr. Ogawa and Mrs. Hayashi. You are expected to do the chores we give you and if you don't then you don't get dinner that night. You must be in school and avoid trouble. We expect you to be in this building by 7 p.m. Dinner is at 5.30 we don't care if you go but know that we do not have snacks or leftovers. All of this is rapid fire said to him as they go up a staircase and down a hallway until they get to a room with a nameplate on it that read Ritsu Ishibashi as she knocked them open the door she kept talking while entering and placing the box on a bed. Ritsu is your roommate he has been here three months and can tell you more. I want it to be made understood. If you cause any trouble you will be kicked out and not welcome back. She said this then swept out of the room leaving Izuku there alone. Chapter 2 Settling In Summary, Izuku meets his roommate and gets a tour of the place. This is probably gonna be the calmest chapter face with tears of joy. No trigger warnings I don't think. Also Ike if I mentioned this but I don't know a lot about Japanese culture so I am using American thingies like Mr. and Mrs. I did do some research though. In other words I am clueless white person. Notes, chapter text. Izuku is unpacked and settled in by the time a slightly older boy walks into the room. He looks surprised to see Izuku there but recovers quickly. Hi, I am Ritsu Ishibachi, but please just call me Ritsu. I will be your roommate for a while. I can see you have mostly moved in. Did Mrs. Kubo give you the rundown? Izuku nodded. I guess I should show you the storage room, Ritsu said gesturing to the unopened box labeled winter clothes. Izuku could find his words so he just nodded and again found himself following someone holding a box. He was lead down to the basement they walked past rooms which Izuku peeked into as they walked by. One room was a laundry room where he saw some kids doing laundry. The next room looked to be a big linen's closet with bedding and pillows. After that was a room with a bunch of cleaning supplies. Finally they reached the end of the hallway it was the only room with a closed door. Ritsu opened the door and in it was shelves with boxes. He showed Izuku the next open spot. Izuku after putting his stuff in the spot turned to Ritsu who nodded in approval then walked out of the room with Izuku trailing behind. I might as well give you a tour so you don't get lost. So first off a little history lesson. This building used to be a school that got shut down for who knows what. The government remains it into a group home for kids like us. Almost every room used to be a classroom. The only people who get a room to themselves are the caregivers, Ritsu said as he started down the hallway. After saying where the group home came from we stepped into the first room Izuku had seen. This magical room is the cleaning supplies room. Us kids are expected to keep this place in tip-top shape. The older you are the more dangerous your job gets and the more chemicals you use. You are expected to do some chores. The caregivers will have a list for you later today probably. Next the bedding closet. Here is where all the bedding stuff and essentials are kept. What Izuku hadn't seen was there was a clear cabinet behind the door stocked with toiletries and towels. The rest of the room was filled with shelves of bedding stuff. And finally for the basement is the laundry room. There are five washers and five dryers. If you don't get your stuff immediately it will probably just be dumped into the floor so someone else can use that dryer or washer so be here to get your stuff. They walked up the stairs to the main floor they walked down the hallway for a bit until turning into a room on their left. This used to be the gym it's now the play, common room. There are toys and other things to keep us children busy. Leaving the room and walking a bit further down the hall then going through a door on the right he continued. This is the dining room it fits us all and has an industrial kitchen in the back. One of the caregivers and the oldest kids cook and serve food. They continued down the hallway until we reached the front doors that Izuku had entered through. Ritsu pointed to a door off to the side and explained that in there were the caretaker's offices and all of the kids' files. You don't want to go in there unless you have to because they get annoyed if you go into their space. Walking down a hallway on the opposite side of the foyer, there were three closed doors with nameplates on them. Each door had one nameplate and on it was one of the three caretakers. There were two on one side and then on on the other at the end of the hallways was another door. This one was clear it led to a library. The library had books and school supplies on them. There were desks shattered around the room and even a comfy sitting spot. All the books are left over from when this was a school. You are expected to keep your grades up and to study this so the place to do it because it's usually really quiet. He explains. Ritsu lead Izuku to another set of stairs on this side of the building that led to the second floor where all the kids were room. On each door were nameplate naming different names half of the doors were painted pink and the other half blue. 
Izuku found to his surprise that this was both a boys' and girls' group home. They were not allowed to date or have the other gender in their rooms. Both genders had their own bathrooms, and they were even separated by wings. There was the girls' wing and the boys' wing. A lot of the kids here are comfortable here and just want to keep going so stay out of the way of people and you should be fine. The caretakers don't really care what we do as long as we don't get anyone pregnant and don't kill anybody. Ritsu explained. He lead Izuku back to their room where he found there was another nameplate on the door that read Izuku Midori. Oh my gosh I completely forgot to ask your name. Well I guess this solves that mystery. Well I am gonna go do my homework so have fun. Ritsu started to leave then turned. His face was completely deadpan and he dead in a very intimidating tone do not touch my stuff or I will break you fingers. Ritsu then walked down the hallway to the stairs like nothing had happened. Blinking Izuku walked into the room. Closing the door behind him he plopped on the squeaky bed and played there before everything of that happened caught up to him and he couldn't stop himself before a sob broke from his chest and he curled up as tears ran down his face. And Ko had disowned him and now he was living in a group home with people he didn't know. He was in a completely different and new home he didn't even know the address of this place. Then it hit him. No one here should know I'm quirkless. As long as no one finds out then I should be fine. In case people ask what I'm kidding people are going to ask I am going to say I have an intelligence quirk that raises my IQ as long as no one has seen my file I am fine. Maybe something good will come out of this. With new hope he dried his tears he got up and grabbed his backpack and headed for the library. He given a corner and did his homework. His mother when he lived with her had bought him an in flip phone for emergencies it was a flip phone because the kids kept breaking his phone so it wasn't worth it buying an expensive one every time. The flip phone let him call, text and tell time that was it. Checking the time he realized it was almost dinner he decided he should get there in the middle so he could figure out what seats were open. He walked in a few minutes late there were about 23 kids either sitting at the multiple tables scattered across the room or standing in line for food. As he was the 26th kid he guessed the other two were serving the food. He got into line. No one bothered him. He got food it was a bowl of rice with a main dish of miso soup and a side of steamed broccoli. No one bothered him. He sat down at a mostly empty table. No one bothered him. As everyone got their food and sat down one of the caregivers a male. The man was covered in grey, black and white fur that made patterns resembling a husky, who he assumes is Mr. Agawa stands up and addresses the whole of the dinning room. Good afternoon noon everyone. I would like everyone to welcome our newest addition Izuku Midoriya. He will be rooming with Ritsu. We will be passing out the new chore list in a second. Have a good rest of your dinner. The man sat himself down. Another woman who he thinks is Mrs. Hayashi walks around handing out a sheet of paper to everyone. She gets to him last. She doesn't have any obvious quirk that shows. Sitting next to him she gives him a few paces of paper. She shuffles through the stack while explaining what each on is. Hello, I am Mrs. Hayashi. I am the nurse here and I am one of the caregivers. This first pamphlet is the rule book. This paper is the address, this is the train schedule and where they go. This is a list of chores you need to do and it also lists the cleaning supplies you will need to do the job. You will need to attend school tomorrow I want you to write down your school, grade, homeroom teacher's name and the school's address down on this paper and then once you figure out your third there write that down too. If you don't have school supplies then talk to Mrs. Kubo she can help you get some. You have already met Mrs. Kubo she is the main director here and she is the one that is most likely to discipline kids, but we can all dish out discipline. The man sitting next to her is Mr. Agawa he runs the kitchen and is the man to go to if you need help with homework. If Ritsu forgot to tell you the old nurse's office is in the main office and that's where you go if you are injured. Have a good rest of your dinner if you have any questions ask one of the staff or fellow kids. Izuku didn't have much appetite to eat so he had been sitting there staring at his food and only took a few bites. He decided to start on the school paperwork Mrs. Hayashi had given him. He looked at the bus and train schedule paper and mapped out his path to school and back he wrote it all down and then wrote down everything else down. He then walked up to the staff table and gave Mrs. Hayashi the paper she thanked him then turned back to her food. Izuku walked back to his table and waited to see how kids took care of their dishes he saw a kid dump any leftover food into a big bin then pushed the dishes through a window that looked like it lead to the kitchen. Izuku did the same before heading back to the library with his papers and looked over the rule book and chore list. The rules were pretty understandable with the lights out hour bathroom rules and all the rules that had been mentioned to him. His chore list consisted of taking the scrap food bin outside to the compost bin where he would dump it and then throw in hay and mix it all up and leave it. He was part of the dishes crew his job was to dry them and lastly he had to scrub the boys' toilets. He headed back to the dinning room and found his way into the kitchen. An older girl waved him over and scolded him for being late then showed him how to dry the dishes and who to hand them to so they could be put away. He got into a rhythm and with that his life in the group home really started. Chapter 3, Maybe This Wasn't Good Summary, everyone finds out he is quirkless and it goes really 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 downhill. 
I have a lot of trigger warnings for this chapter I will but a spoiler summary at the end. Trigger warning list. Abuse. Bullying. Neglect. Description of self-harm. Self-deprecation. Suicidal idealization. Panic attacks. Bad grammar. Notes. Chapter text. He was wrong he was so 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 wrong to think that living in the group home would go well. At first no one talked to him and it was great because he didn't want to talk and didn't know if he had it in him zero to talk. But slowly people started talking to him or more like at him. They seemed to accept him but then someone had snuck into the main office and read his file. They found out he was quietness and that's when it began. He got smaller food portions. His chores were sabotaged so he would have to do them multiple times he was even forced to do other kids chores. They would threaten to tell the caregivers that he was breaking rules if he didn't. By the end of the week he was doing every part of cleaning the dishes. He was cleaning the whole boy's bathroom and tending to the garden. His clothes would be taken out of the dryer or washer mid-cycle and left all over the floor or even hidden. The showers were stall style with a curtain separating him from everyone his clothes were stolen multiple times. Ritsu wouldn't talk to him and let people into the room so they could mess or steal Izuka's stuff. The staff did nothing and let it happen. Ritsu hated him. The older kids started beating him up when they realized the staff wouldn't do anything. He hated himself and everyone around him. Again and again he was left to be beaten up and teased. He was abandoned and now had no escape from never-ending bias. He was chased all the way to his train by the bullies at his school and then some kids from the group home went on the same train as him so he never was away from them. He wanted to die. He wanted it all to be over. The kids at the group home seemed to have the same thought. When he got to the group home he was dragged by two older boys to the library they pushed him down and started taking their anger out on him. Useless pace of shit. You're so useless that even your parents don't want you. No one will ever want you. You are going to be here forever. You should do us all a favor and kill yourself instead of take up a spot from a kid who deserves to be here. What a waste of room and food. It continues on like this with each of them taking turns insulting him and kicking him. The older boy of the two Tatsuki grabbed him by the collar of his school uniform pulling him up to his face and said, No one wants you here and you don't deserve to be here. Go kill yourself or something productive like leaving. You useless scum. Tatsuki spit in his face before throwing him back to the floor leaving with the other boy trailing. Izuku played there staring at the ceiling his body throbbing from the kicks to his body. Tears threatened to leave his eyes but he wiped them then stood up dusting himself he headed to his room. As much as he hated saying it he had gotten mostly used to the bull. He knocked on the door and waited for the door to open. Once Ritsu found out he was quirkless he told Izuku he wasn't allowed into the room without permission and he could only go in to sleep otherwise. He needed to take a shower so he needed his toiletries. It took a bit but then Ritsu partly opened the door he looked Izuku up and down then asked, What do you want? Shower was all Izuku said. He quickly found it wasn't worth waiting words cause no one would listen. Ritsu opened the door and let Izuku in. He quickly grabbed everything he needed then went to the showers he had learned to put his clothes and towel into a plastic bag so he could bring them in with him without them being soaked. This was to keep them from being stolen. Jumping into the shower he looked at his thighs there were parallel lines some healed other not. He took the razor he had stored in his towel and added another three lines. Each line marked a day since his disowning. 62 lines. 62 days since he had been kicked out. 62 days since he had been brought to this place. 62 days since he saw Enko through the crack of the door. Tears welled in his eyes looking at his damaged skin. Taking a breath he went on taking his shower letting the tears fall until he turned the water off. He got dressed in the shower stall. He grimaced when the clothes slid over the fresh cuts. Getting out of the shower he brushed his teeth and tried to not look in the mirror. His classmates found out that Enko disowned him somehow. And were now not trying to hide beating him up and were now hitting his face which was new. He saw something move in the corner of his eye and looked up to see it was the reflection in the mirror and he was stuck looking at himself. His bottom lip was cracked and swollen. There was a burn on his neck, half of his left eyebrow was burned off. His nose was now permanently crooked. There was a fading black eye. He was pale and his baby fat was gone. He hadn't been eating well and all the running he did didn't help. His greenish-black curly messy hair was getting pretty long he would have to cut it soon. He hated how much he looked like his mother. He frowned at himself then picked up his stuff and headed back to his room. He did the door routine and was able to stay since it was late enough to go to bed. He was called into the main office by Mrs. Kubo who led him to her office. I regret to inform you that Mr. Watanabe has given up on your case. We are looking for another social worker but it is hard because of your situation. I am not sure we can find a family for you since you are soon to be 11 so in a month or so we are going to move you to an older kids group home so you can live out your time there. I also wanted to talk to you about your behavior issues. I have seen you start fights with multiple kids and this is not okay if you continue this we will have no choice but to move you early. Also your principal called about your suspension that is not okay. 
Your punishment is, you are grounded so you must stay in your room and hand over your phone, you can only leave your room to go to the bathroom, do chores or to go to dinner. I also want you to write an apology to your teachers for disrespecting them and making them suspend you. You are free to go she started writing on a piece of paper on her desk. Izuku handed over his phone. He got up and walked out. He went up to his room and looked at the door that only had his name on it. Ritsu had been fostered out so Izuku had the room to himself. I am a failure. I am just a giant problem. I should just go kill myself. I bring everyone around me trouble. He sat on his bed with these thoughts swirling in a never-ending loop. His hand itched to hold his blade and add more lines. He couldn't breathe. He was going to be stuck forever here. No one wanted him. His door opened. He couldn't breathe. Three people entered his room. He couldn't breathe. He was pulled up from his bed by his long hair. He c-o-u-l-d and breath. He was thrown to the ground. He c-o-u-l-d and breath. They surrounded him. He c-o-u-l-d and breath. They were grabbing him. Hands, 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 hitting, hitting, hitting. He c-o-u-l-d and breath. All at once he could hear the voices around him. They were familiar, so were the hands hitting him. Look at this little crybaby. He can't handle a few hits. Useless. Waste. Of. Space. Each word punctuated with a kick to the ribs. All he could do was lay there on the ground and take it. Move. Get up. Fight. Don't just take it. A rage a rage like no other filled him they kept hitting him, taunting him, killing him with each word. Rage filled his every cell. He grabbed the closest person's foot and pulled on it until the kid was on his back he scrambled on the kid straddling him and just wailed on him. He could feel the other two stop in surprise then run to their friend's rescue they tried to get Izuku off but Izuku would let up. He punched the kid that had tormented him since the beginning. He is yanked back by his hair until he is off the kid he turned to the person who holds his hair and again rage fills him. He tackles the kid and rains his weak small fist on the bully's head torso and pretty much anywhere he can hit. The third kid runs from the room yelling for one of the caregivers. Izuku doesn't care. His arms ache and he stops and looks around as the rage cools off. The first kid Tatsuki lay motionless his face already swollen and bloody only his chest rising and falling said he was still alive. The kid he was on right now had covered his head with his arms and was shaking under Izuku. Izuku staggered up. There is no reason to stay. Any place I go will be the same. Still brain fogged he grabbed a blanket and put a two sweatshirts on it in a change of clothes then bunched it up like a sack. He threw on his school bag and started on his way out. He stepped over Tatsuki and while stepping around Deji his foot was grabbed by said boy. Where do you think you are going? Deji said with a sneer. Izuku looked back unamused and with his other foot turned and kicked Deji across the face causing him to pass out. Shaking his foot fared he left the room he saw Haruki, the third kid, jogging down the hall with Mr. Ogawa not far behind. Izuku started sprinting the other direction and Mr. Ogawa gave chase following him to the other side and down the stairs. Mr. Ogawa was catching up fast. Izuku ran out the fire exit and ran as fast as he could he got to the end of the street before he was pushed into an alley by Mr. Ogawa. Izuku head snapped to the side as a furry fist hits him across the face. You think you can just get your way by beating people up? You think you can hurt other kids and not of consequences? Mr. Ogawa punches Izuku so hard he lands on his ass. Mr. Ogawa kept hitting him. At some point Izuku stopped feeling. He lay there as his vision dims. Before he passes out he hears Mr. Ogawa spit and a second later it lands on his cheek. Wetness hits his cheek then more than more until he is drenched. He opens his eyes as much as he can. His head throbbing. Brick, brick, brick. Puddle, blood, blood. Why blood? It then comes back he is laying in an alley beaten half to death after running away. Why did I run away? Anger, fist flying. Tatsuki bloody face all flashed through his muddy mind. Right, I need to move before they come back. He crawled to the wall of the alley and used it to stagger up. His bones creak and his muscles ache. His clothes stick and scratch at the bruises and scrapes on him. He gets dizzy and almost falls over. He sees his things spread around the alley. His backpack open with all of his school stuff destroyed. His blanket and sweaters in a puddle with shoe prints on them. He limps over folding the sweatshirt and blanket he stuffs them into his backpack and drags behind him as he trudges out of the alley. He walks down the street people stare at him but he doesn't care because all he wants to do is sleep. While he limps through that cold rain he makes two promises. I will never cry in front of anyone again. I will never let myself be bullied, abused or taken advantage of again. Chapter 4 Homelessness isn't too bad. Summary Izuku learns how I be homeless and starts to understand what is going on. He see a glimpse of a racer head but just thinks he looks homeless too. Izuku also picks up some street smarts. Notes I know I said italics meant thought and that's what they did mean. I write the chapter somewhere else then copy-paste them to here. I didn't realize that it didn't copy my bolted words. When I finish this fic I will go back and fix it but until then think of most of this as his inner thought unless it is in a third person's point of view. Trigger Warning Violence and Homelessness Chapter Text 
It's his 11th birthday, and he is on a rooftop hiding from an angry homeless man apparently Izuku had been in his alley. It had been a week or so since he ran away from the group home and he had no plan to go back. His injuries still hadn't healed and he didn't think they would for a while. He was still limping and hadn't been able to run that why he had climbed the nearest fire escaper to get to the roof. It hurt a lot but it was better than getting beat up by a crazy homeless man. He stayed on the roof for a long time until he was pretty sure the coast was clear. He climbed down and hobbled down the street looking for a clear alley he finally found one that didn't look like it had anyone living in it. He plopped down and sat there just thinking and made a checklist of things he would need to do. I need to get food. I need to cut my hair it's still too long and I can't take a chance of someone grabbing it he shivered at the thought of Deji's fist pulling his hair. Yeah I really need to cut it. I need to find a solid place to sleep. His stomach hurt from not having in any food for a bit. It helped that he hadn't been able to eat much at the group home because they either didn't give him equal portions or they sabotaged his food by making him drop it. He still had about 17, 300 yen left from the money his mother gave him. The rest had been spent on an alarm clock and to replace clothes that had been lost or accidentally destroyed. It was also used to buy new school supplies and bandages since Mrs. Hayashi refused to heal him more than once a week. She said it was a waste of her quirk since he was just going to get hurt again the next day. She wasn't wrong. He held on before giving on and going into a store and buying some cans of soup and other non-perishables or really whatever would fit in his bag he tried to make sure he had 7000 yen. He walks out of the store and returns to his spot that he think he will claim since no one has come to chase him away. He could not open the can fast enough he pulled the tab and sucked down the veggie soup. He sat back and thought about opening another can but then thought better since he might be without food for a while. He had also bought a bottle of water and a small bottle of ibuprofen he took three and took a few sips of water. He would need to save it until he found safe drinking water. He was in so much pain he couldn't move or explore like he wanted to. He did get up to find enough cardboard to cover the ground where he would sleep then setting his bag up like a pillow he took the blanket out of his bag and put it over himself. He laid there and waited for the painkillers to kick in so he could sleep. He was still sore but he couldn't wait around anymore. His face had become less swollen and he could see fully now. That morning he had packed his back. He decided in the beginning that he would always with him in case he couldn't return to his spot. Today he was on the hunt for a new place to stay because his didn't offer enough shelter he also wanted a more access to the things he needed while getting farther away from the group home. He walked all day that's all he did was walk he kept walking in the opposite directions of the group home and that was his only real direction on where he was going. He stopped when things started looking more familiar. New rule don't go into your old neighborhood. He took a right so was walking away from his old neighborhood but also not getting closer to the group home. Oh it's getting dark and his feet are killing him at the next non-lived-in alley he plops himself down. He had a can of soup. He had been having one every two days to save food. He went to get a sip of water but found there was a few sips left. Note to self, go look for safe drinking water tomorrow. Throwing his trash into the nearest dumpster he settled in for the night. He wakes up early and packs up. He liked the spot but he would have to stay there a few days to make sure someone didn't already live there and who knows maybe he would find something better. Stepping hurts his feet they are still sore from how far he walked yesterday. Lucky for him today was just a scouting day. He would walk around and see what he was working with. He still got weird looks from other pedestrians since he was a grubby gross bruised teen limping around. He still had a limp since he his right side ribs were so bruised he was trying to avoid it as much as possible. He had done a quick block circle then went around a little wider always returning to his spot so he always knew where it was comparing to other places. About 200 feet down the street was a convenience store with a teen cashier. 300 feet in the opposite direction was a market. If he crossed the street and continued down that way for almost half a mile he comes up on a park with public restrooms and a water fountain for the kids that played on the playground. He filled his water bottle up and kept walking. If he went to the right of the park for two miles he found a soup kitchen open to all it even had a bathroom with shower stalls to clean up. He would have to thank whoever thought of this. He kept walking around but didn't find anything more that would be too useful. He went to the convenience store he bought a one-gallon water jug. His plan was to drink the water then use it so he didn't have to go to the park every day. He searched and found a cleanish alley that was in the middle of it all so he didn't have to walk too far in one direction he did choose to be closer to the park since it had water and bathrooms. He was determined to keep this alley no matter what. He was still in the red light district so there were a lot of homeless people or just bad people that had turf and they wouldn't be happy if some scrawny kid took it over. Tonight he would sleep with something next to him to fight anyone off. The spot was his. No one had come to claim it so he started making himself comfortable he again made a cardboard box mattress but he also pushed a dumpster that was in the alley away from the wall and then flipped the lids so they were being held up by the alley wall. Giving him some sort of shelter he then paid the cardboard between the wall and dumpster so he had walls on two side of him and with the dumpster lids he had a roof. Two walls away from a home. 
He went from dumpster to dumpster finding things to insulate himself like newspaper, paper, fabric, plastic sheet, or really anything that could shelter him a bit more. He used a trash can to cover the open end that faced into the alley and made a makeshift wall with cardboard so the trash can held it against the dumpster. He then walked around until he found a donations bin he opened it and took the first bag off the top that quickly got out of there to avoid someone seeing him. When he got back to his spot he went through the bag and took out anything he could use then used the fancy or just really girly clothes to block the bottom of the dumpster so there wasn't a draft. He now had four walls and it pointed to the opening of the alley. Happy with what he had done he got unwrapping himself in his blanket and using his bag as a pillow he want to sleep. Izuku had become sort of a night person. He wasn't going to school anymore he hadn't since he left the group home and also it was dangerous to not be aware at night. He had learned that the not fun way when another homeless person tried to take Izuku's home so he had to fight him off. Apparently a brick is scary. Izuku knew he was too small to fight people off without some sort of weapon so he started carrying a brick with him as self-defense since he couldn't find anything better. He was walking around at night when he heard what sounded like someone getting mugged. He wasn't planning on stopping it but he might help the victim once the mugger was gone. He peeked his head around the corner into the alley and saw quite the scene. There was a victim. On the ground huddled in a ball she was shaking and using the wall as a brace and there were two men fighting. One had a mask of sorts on that hit his face he was failing at fending off the other man who was in a fully black outfit he had long black hair that cascaded down his back and shoulders bright yellow goggles looked half pushed off. He was using a very long grey scarf that he was using to restrain one of the attacker's arms. All of a sudden the mugger sprayed dust right into the other guy's face from his free hand. The other man staggered for a second before recovering and taking the mugger down with a few well-placed punches and a neck chop. When the mad took out Quirk's oppression cuffs it became clear this man was a hero and it looked like he was an underground hero. Why does an underground hero look homeless was a question that was circling Izuka's head. The man took out his phone texted someone then when he was sure that the mugger was restrained and incapacitated he walked over to the victim. He started comforting her. He decided he couldn't keep calling him the man so he decided his name was now Homeless Hero. Izuku wasn't worried anymore so he walked away once he heard the sound of sirens approaching. The next day he went back to that alley to look at the scene and found a knife that the mugger had dropped. Score. He skipped happily back to his little makeshift home with his new weapon. Chapter 5. Green Cherub is Born. Summary. Izuku starts accidentally training to be a vigilante. He also runs into trouble. He finds out he likes helping people. Notes. So it wasn't in the original plan but I realize I should have put it in the warning if Izuku was gonna help victims. In this chapter Izuku helped a rape victim in the aftermath so this is the warning. Trigger warning. Violence. Mention rape. Chapter text. Izuku in the past month has learned how to fight a little I mean he has had to to keep the other people from his spot. He quickly stopped going to the soup kitchen since they didn't like a quirkless kid going there. Apparently it kept other people away. He started dumpster diving for food and sometimes freeing money from non-carful people. Okay he stole it but he needs it. He ran out of his mother's money pretty quickly and then the soup kitchen wouldn't feed him. He has had to resort to washing up in the public bathrooms he washes his hair in the sink and uses a beige of a towel he sets in the sink then puts soap on it he then washes stinky places like armpits. When his clothes get too worn or gross he uses them as insulation or bedding and will replace it with clothes he takes from donation bins or clothes lines. A week ago he took someone's phone but it had a passcode so he ended up throwing it away. He went into the richer area and started snatching phones until he found one without a password. He looked up a video of how to wipe a phone then wiped the phone. He now had a phone. But he couldn't use it to mush since one he didn't have internet so he couldn't really text anyone and also he didn't have a charger. But he had an idea of how to get one. He walked onto a subway he paid the fee then walked around until he found someone sleepy he checked their bag no charger but a 1000 yen. He continued doing this until he finally found a charger it only took him spending most of the day rummaging through bags and pickpocketing. He felt bad pickpocketing but he only did it to those who had looked like they had money and he only took a little bit. Also he wasn't very good at it he could only do it to those who were practically asking for it. He ended up leaving with a charger and 4032 yen. He wandered around till he found an internet cafe. He decided to celebrate. He charged the phone and got a small hot chocolate and a cookie. He signed into the free Wi-Fi and for the first time in a long time he surfed the web. He was so giddy his feet were kicking back and forth as he scrolled through the news. He had been so wrapped up in surviving he didn't know any of the new heroes or what the hero ranking was. But more important than that he had gotten the phone to do self-defense and workout research. He was chased out of any library he went into so this was his next best option he started with looking up the basics but quickly ran into a problem. How would he remember all of this? It's not like he could look this up outside of a cafe. He decided it was time to get back into analysis but instead of analyzing to become a hero he would be analyzing to survive. 
Calling it a day on the web serving he went to a the closest store that sold notebooks and pencil. He got two notebooks and some pencils with the money left over from that day. Had filled a whole notebook with self-defense techniques and the basics of getting stronger without the use of a gym. He had been spending any free time he could building muscle and learning how to defend himself. At some point he found himself more offensive fighting beginner techniques. It had come in handy when a homeless man came to steal his spot and he was able to defend himself enough for the homeless man to go away. In no way was Izuku ready to actually fight he had gone against a man that didn't really care. He got beat up a bunch but was defending himself enough that it wasn't a bad. As helpful as the research was it didn't really help in real life situations. So he decided to do a different type of research he went around looking for hero fights where he would watch the fight and analyze it. He did this with the second notebook and with both of these he filled every single inch since had spent money on a non-necessity. His favorite thing was to find the homeless hero guy and watch his fights. He soon figured out the guy's quirk because of this and it was so cool. Izuku was running for what might literally be his life. He had pickpocketed the wrong person and messed up. The guy realized what was going on and started chasing him down the street. Izuku was weaving between people and trying to loose the guy, in the maze of alleys and the crowd of people. He was in the richer part of town outside the red light district. He didn't know the area and it bit him in the ass when he ran into a dead end. He quickly looked for an escape and saw a fire escape he started going up it but the guy had caught up to him. He grabbed Izuku by his long hair and yanked him off the ladder. All of a sudden he was back in the group home and was being pulled off his bed by Deji and being beat up again. The guy held him by his hair and was glaring at Izuku. Izuku with a grimace tried to be intimidating back by not showing fear. That was kind of hard to do when the person you are trying to intimidate had you dangling by your hair. When did this guy get so big and strong? He had gone for a skinny guy but apparently he has a transforming quirk. Izuku was fighting off the flashbacks of Deji. He needed to stay present and be ready. Give me back what you took from me brat. The man sneered at him. Izuku put his hands up in a surrendering gesture then reached into his pocket but instead of pulling out the money he had stolen he grabbed his knife from his waist and then drove it into the man's bicep while also bringing his knee up to knee the man in the stomach. The man dropped Izuku in favor of cradling his arm. Izuku ran out of there as fast as he could. He also hid as quickly as he could. While watching his favorite hero he decided to follow the hero but quickly realized how hard that would be since he wasn't on the rooftops using Parker to get across the city without have to go around buildings or move around people like Izuku did on the ground. He added that to his list of things he should learn. The next morning he went back to the internet cafe and started researching beginner Parker stuff. He would have to build up his speed, stamina and strength also become more graceful and coordinated. He researched how to get better at doing all of these and back to work he went. As he started doing more he needed to eat more so he did and it helped him a lot. He did have to find another soup kitchen and did have to dumpster dive more but it was worth it because he was getting stronger slowly but surely. He had started moving around the city by rooftop to get used to being up there. He used the park to help by doing parker on the playset and he started just trying to use it more casually. Since he had been moving around a lot more and following heroes he realized how much crime was going on and how much wasn't being stopped because there simply wasn't enough attention on the red light district it was pretty much only homeless here, fighting and new heroes who thought they could solve all the crime and fix the red light district. Izuku also realized how big the homeless community was. He already kinda knew but this really showed. He started making friends with some and soon joined the community. It actually came in handy a lot because the homeless knew where safe places to eat and drink were where it was safe to shower and what stores had cheap prices. They also knew all the places to avoid. Izuku wished he had been more friendly earlier so he could learn some of this stuff earlier. And he probably would have been better off but he honestly didn't want to spend too much time regretting the past. One day while Izuku was running across the roofs his hair got in his face and he almost fell. This coupled with the fact he didn't need long hair. It was a hassle to maintain and as the man a few months ago had demonstrated he can be grabbed by it. So he did what any sane person would do he went to the public bathrooms at the park and with his knife he chopped his hair as short as he could. It took a really long time since a knife isn't a practical tool but it did the job well enough he was now rocking a choppy buzz cut. It honestly looked really bad but it was fine because who was he trying to impress? His head did feel lighter and he found he could hear better without his thick hair blocking his ears. While he was walking past an alley looking for homeless hero he heard crying and from within it, he stopped and looked in. There was a huddled by the wall crying dot he decided to help. He walked closer and quickly realized why she was crying. Her dress was torn and it was kinda obvious what had happened. Izuku took off his sweater and layered it over the woman who flinched at the unexpected touch. Her head snapped up to look at him and his heart skipped a beat because he had never seen such fear in someone's eyes before it reminded him of younger him. He crouched down across from her keeping his movements televised so she knew what he was doing. Are you okay? How can I help? Izuku asked. 
His voice was gravely from not talking in so long but she needed help and he was there and could help. The woman sniffed and in a weak voice said, Can you stay with me for a bit? He nodded in response. Do you want to talk about it? He asked in the softest voice he could. I couldn't stop him and he ripped my clothes. I have to walk home looking like the slut I am. Hey whoa first off you are not a slut second that in no way was okay of him to do. But he said I was teasing him all night I mean I was wearing this dress and I was dancing. How can you ask for something with clothes? Dress how you want no one should ever take advantage over you for it. You were dancing and having fun not trying to get his unwanted attention. He didn't deserve this at all. Izuku is now sitting on the ground with the woman holding her hands. She sniffles then looks makes eye contact for the first time since he walked up. Really, I am complete telling the truth. She woman broke down in tears again. Izuku asked if he could hug her she said yes so he sat there hugging her as she let it all out. When she was done crying he asked if he could walk her home she nodded and they walked home. Izuku let the woman keep the sweater as cover so she was covered. When they got to her apartment complex she thanked him then walked into her apartment he walked back to his spot. While he walked back he realized that he liked helping her. He liked being there and being able to help her and protect her till she got home. A spark lit in him and he realized what he was going to do. Chapter 6 Who Needs a License? Summary Izuku starts real vigilante work and catches the attention of a hero and detective. Notes It is 3am for me and I am tired so I might go to bed for once but I will try to add the next chapters as soon as possible. T-R-I-G-E-R Warning Violence Chapter Text Over the past month Izuku has been tending to the victims of crimes that don't get stopped. He carries bandages and other medical first aid stuff, small snacks, and even a sewing kit. He learned to sew so he could help if clothes were ruined. He also saved up money until he could buy a flip phone in some minutes so he could call the police without it being traced to him. At some point he realized he was tired of getting there after a crime had happened, after someone had been scarred for life and would be traumatized. He wanted to be there to stop it from happening. One problem as much as he had been working on his fighting skills and Parker he still wasn't ready. As much as he honestly didn't care about dying he didn't want to die painfully like by being beaten to death. So he decided he was gonna work really hard and get to the point that he was confident he could win before he started fighting crime. In the meantime he would keep helping those in need and learning. For about a month Detective Nayamasa had been getting letters of thanks. For what you may ask, apparently the red light district got a guardian angle. There has been someone who people are mistaking as a pro hero showing up after crimes and comforting people. All these letters are thanking him of all people that this person was there. One even said I think choosing a person that looked like a child was a really good choice for a rescue hero. I wasn't scared when he showed up. The detective is about 60% sure this is a prank on him because when was there a child-like rescue hero in the red light district? He had checked records and there were none. The first letter he thought was a joke but the more he gets the more he is realizing that a civilian is going around comforting people. He decided to start a file with all the letters and any other reports of this civilian but he couldn't come up with a name. But then it his him. From the description it was a person that looked like a child and seemed to be acting like a guardian angel so he named the file. Cherub. After the child guardian angels in different religions, he decided that he wanted to meet the guy so he sent a copy of the file to a hero who patrolled that area eraser head. He added a text asking him to see if he could find the guy and get him into Naomasa's office. He got quick one word affirmation from the man. Just in case he added, this person is good please treat them nicely. He got an answer that he didn't know how to feel. I will try. What was that supposed to mean? Izuku had been training and doing all he could to learn. Since he didn't have school and was able to get into a routine that got all the essential stuff out of the way he could spend the rest of the day and into the night learning different forms of martial arts, self-defense, knife skills, and Parker. He knew he wasn't a pro at any of these but he was fairly confident he had spent over five monehas building strength, stamina, and speed. He was also continually trying to better himself. He continued to follow around heroes and seeing what real fighting looks like and he learned some stuff but he knew seeing and doing are different. He would memorize the city while he practiced roof running. Something he had already learned because of his past was stealth but he worked on that too. He would sneak up on animals like birds and stray cats to see how close he could get before they noticed him. He almost pet a bird the other day. During this time he found a beach covered in trash he used some trash to make his home better. Yes he was calling it his home now. He also used some trash and some dumpster diving to make his gear. He went behind a sporting store that he found one day and he found some knee pads and other protective gear. He sewed the knee pads into some heavier duty pants he had grabbed from a donation bin. He then sewed elbow pads into the elbow of his undershirt. He was lucky when he found some shin guards in the dumpster a few days later. Let's just say he visited there a lot to get most of the gear he was wearing. Most of it had small problems that really didn't affect their performance but for one reason or another were not saleable. A few months and he started wearing a mask when he ran because he didn't want anyone to know his actual identity. 
He finally felt ready to go out and start helping stop the crime. He was ready for his first patrol. He moved along the roofs trying to listen for suspicious sound. He ended up finding a mugging and he stopped it but a problem quickly made itself clear. How was he going to keep the perp there if he didn't have anything to restrain them with? He can't stand here waiting for police to get their cause he would be caught to. He also probably shouldn't leave the victim alone. Quite the dilemma. Looking around the alley he didn't see anything useful so he ended up calling the police and waiting till police were pretty much out of their cars before he bolted. The second he was sure he was safe he walked into the first store and was looking for things to restrain with and he found duct tape. To be specific he found jade green duct tape. He bought two rolls then walked out. Why did that cashier look so nervous? He continued his patrol. He stopped two more muggings. Each mugger was restrained with tape keeping their hands behind them and tape over their mouths. Each victim was given first aid. When the police arrived the statement was consistent and the person didn't really see their savior and couldn't describe them. When he went home for the night he was smiling because of all he had done. He had stopped three muggings that wouldn't have been stopped before. He was being a hero and he didn't even have a license. Chapter 7 The Real Work Begins Summary Izuku becomes a real vigilante and saves grandma. Trigger warning Depressed kid Violence Notes Chapter Text He had been doing vigilante work for a week and he was hurting he had bruises and cuts all over his body. Most of them were because he wasn't fully prepared yet and wasn't great at fighting. One guy almost got him on the ground and that really scared Izuku. He had been using duct tape to keep most people there but one or two woke up and broke the tape. They went after Izuku while he was comforting the victim. He had to come up with a way to restrain them better. Another thing he found was he needed a longer range attack system because having to get in close with villains was not always a great idea. Something he found out about himself is he hated talking he hated speaking so 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 much so he just didn't if he didn't have to. He talked to victims because he didn't think they knew sign language and most of them are in panic mode so they wouldn't be able to focus on it. When Izuku was a kid he had learned some sign language for Kachin since there was a giant chance he would lose his hearing. How was Kachin doing? He hadn't talked to the him for almost a year now. Dot 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 it was a year three days ago. He had been homeless for a year. He didn't believe it so going on his phone he used the calendar app and did the math. It was a year three days ago and in a few days it would be his twelfth birthday. A pit grew in his stomach and he couldn't sleep anymore so he got up from his little hut and climbed to the roof of the building and laced up there. Over the past few months he had found he was really comfortable on the roofs of the city because he had control. It was one of the only places in his life that he had control over so he ended up spending a lot of time on roofs. It was late afternoon he had started sleeping during the day because people didn't bother him as much during the day. At night he had been up and around. He did use daytime to do stuff like eat and other things that required light. So much had happened since he was 10 he had lived more in the past two years than he had his whole life. He hated that this was what he was left with. This is what he had become. It was exactly what the statistics said he would be. Well not quite he is still alive but most quirkless kids are disowned or abandoned then left to fend for themselves. He realized now that what Inko did was a lot nicer than she could have done and it was a lot nicer than most parents of quirkless kids. She gave him money and had packed all of his stuff up even gave him all his paperwork. And called a social worker to come grab him. He didn't call her mom cause that wasn't what she was she wasn't his mother. He knew he wouldn't be sleeping so he curled up in a ball on the roof looking over the city. He wished he could see the stars but the light pollution was too much. Everything that had happened hit him and he wanted to cry but when you are out here you never knew who was watching and he couldn't break his promise. He honestly was tired he was so tired of surviving but he didn't really have any other choice it was either this or kill himself which now that he had a purpose he didn't want to do as much. He was angry. Why was this his fate because he didn't have a quirk like everyone else? Why should he be nice to people who wouldn't be nice to him if they knew he was quirkless? All these years he had just sat there and let himself and others get bullied he had sat there and felt sorry for himself and just took it. He hated it he hated that if he had trained earlier he probably wouldn't be in bad of a situation as he is. Being sad for himself wasn't productive he had work to do. That night when he was being a vigilante he might have been a little more rough and zoned out than usual for the first time he made it the whole night without too many solid hits in on him. He had been in a robot-like mood for the past few weeks he ate sleep trained and then went on patrol. He stopped being gentle with villains. The only way they would stay down is if they knew they couldn't win. He had gotten better at fighting the more he did it. He realized he was fighting like he was a big person and not the way he was. He started taking cheap shots and tried to end the fight as quickly as possible. If that meant breaking a nose, so be it. He was getting stronger and he didn't care because those villains would have hurt someone else and had probably hurt people before so they needed to be taught a lesson. He kept comforting people best he could he found he even changed his personality for the victims he because goody and sweet a lot different from the dirty fighter who did anything to win. On one patrol he was losing horribly when the victim passed him a broken pole. He used it as a bat and took back the upper hand. 
After that he did research on bow staffs. He knew where he could get one. He searched and searched in the richer areas until he found a martial arts building. He broke in and searched around until he found the weapons he found the bow staffs. These once could be disconnected into two baby staffs he took them and left. Learning to pick a lock had become really handy. He trained with the bow staff until he was confident with it and then on his hoodie sew in little sheets for the bow staff on his back. Did he take inspiration from old ninja movies? Yes yes he did. With this new power he was able to take down villains more efficiently and now he could hit those with skin changes that looked sharp. A few patrols later, he was saving a woman from a raper and was failing. The guy had the weird knife quirk where he could pull knives out of his skin. It was fucking terrifying. Okay, this is inconvenient. How do I beat someone who always has a weapon handy? Where are the knives even coming from? Okay, okay every quirk has a drawback what is this guy's? Izuku started switching to more defensive so he could analyze the guy. Every few knives he seemed to slow down the production and he was getting more sluggish. If I can hold him off for long enough he will have to either surrender or switch to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Thank god I was obsessed with quirks as a kid. He kept on the defensive until finally he saw his opening and hit the guy in his neck with the bow staff hitting the fainting nerve. He had studied those too. The guy fell like a sack of potatoes. Holy cow I am out of breath. Where did the victim go? He looked around and couldn't find the girl so he taped up the guy and called the police. When he was sure the police were nearby he scaled the building and was on the roof. He ran for a bit then stopped to catch his breath. He heard yelling in the distance so he took off in that direction. He peeked over the edge of the building to see what was happening. There were two men yelling at this old lady who was yelling at the men something about ruining the neighborhood. You drug dealers are ruining the neighborhood. She yelled. Go away old lady you don't know what you're doing. I know that I am stopping a deal going on she retorted. Go grandma. If you don't leave we are going to make you leave. How are you gonna make me leave? I don't think you want assault and drug dealing on your record. I don't care. The thug pulled out a knife. Guess it was his turn to intervene but one problem. How am I supposed to go up against two thugs? I is tiny. I will have to wait for the right moment first am I call the police here maybe I can escape and leave this for the police. Izuku pulled out his phone and called the police and when the line picked up he gave the address then hung up. This is what he had been doing for a bit and it always worked. The police knew it was him by now so they just show up. Fuck it a man just do this he jumped down onto the guy without at the knife's back from the fire escape. The guy series like a kid and fell to the ground. Izuku brought down his bow staff on the thug's head quickly taking him out so he could focus on the other thug that was now charging at Izuku. Izuku backed up to try to create room. The guy hadn't shown in quirk yet so he was still an unknown but he was about to attack that old lady so he couldn't wait. The man swung with his knife at Izuku. Izuku blocked it with the bow staff then used the other half of the bow staff to hit the guy in his exposed rigs. The guy grimaced and backed up. Damn it that hurt. Izuku kept ready and tried to asses the man. He didn't want to run at him until he had an idea of what the guy's quirk was. He was happy he stayed back when the man's arm stretched out and grew till it was around 5 feet long. Izuku barely dodged the fist. Well this is gonna be interesting. I can't get close so I have to be smart. He looked around the alley and found something that could help. He took up a piece of brick that had broken off the wall. If I can hit him in the head then I should be fine or if I hit him somewhere that makes him lose focus. Wait I know he drew back the piece of brick and aimed it he quickly threw it. It flew past the villain's defense and hit directly where he wanted. It is the man in his neck the guy completely doubled over holding his neck. Izuku walked up to him and chopped his nerve and the man was down. He turned to the old lady that was looking smugly at the two down villains and she started talking as Izuku restrained them. Thank you for coming to the rescue. I had it handled but it was nice to see them get the shit beat out of them. Hey any chance you could start stopping drug deals? They are bringing down the neighborhood and the kids aren't safe. Izuku nodded. He had to leave since the sirens were pretty much there. He started climbing the fire escape when the old lady called up. Thank you green cherub you have been helping a lot. He smiled under his mask as he left. He was taking down only muggers and rapists because it was one person and usually it was a small job. He didn't know if he was ready for drug dealers. They usually came with gangs and he was not ready to up against more than one or two people at once. He was at a big disadvantage. I still have so much more to learn and do. Guess I know what I am researching tomorrow. The next day he researched how to fight multiple targets and then at night started following around the homeless hero which he had found out was a racer head a bit ago but he liked homeless hero better. Ugh everything is saying something different. Some say to take out the biggest threat first but others say to take out the smaller ones and then a whole different thing says take out whatever is easiest. Fuck I am not ready for this. She did ask that I help. If I get killed then I get killed I guess. The cherub case had grown larger and bigger than he ever thought it would. It started as a guy comforting people but now turned into a vigilante running around and taking down muggers. From the reports it seems that the guy doing this wore a green hoodie. And people seemed to come to the same conclusion about Cherub so the locals of the red light district were calling him Green Cherub. 
Now Naamasa didn't disagree with them that he was a guardian angel that was helping but from reports it was looking like this was a kid and not an adult. He was described as small and scrawny. He would be lying if he said this case wasn't keeping him awake. Where did this kid come from? Why is he doing this? Well I know why the red light district is drowning in crime. He is helping but it isn't safe for a kid to be taking down people twice his size. I need to get him off the street. I think I know who to set on this Naamasa pulled out his phone and scrolled till he found his contact. The man picked up on the third ring. Eraser head here. What do you want at this ungodly hour Naamasa? He didn't realize it was R in the morning. Do you remember the cherub kid case I wanted you to look into? Yes. Well the kid went from comforting victims to stopping crime and has become a vigilante. I am pretty sure this is a kid from description. The red light district locals are Kali and Jihim Green Cherub. I need you to stop him so he doesn't end up dead. Sure I'll see what I can do. I had already heard whispers but I thought he was still only comforting victims. Before Naamasa could respond Eraser had hung up. That was all Naamasa could do other than keep trying to solve this case from his desk. Chapter 8 Never Back Down Never What Summary Izuku is now Aizawa's newest project and he really doesn't want to be. Chapter Text Izuku was in trouble like big trouble. It had been a bit since he started stopping drug deals. He had found himself in a few sticky situations when he was overwhelmed but either ended up finding a way to win or running away. What a brave thing to do. Tonight he had seen a drug deal going on later in his patrol. It was what he thought was only two men but as the fight began two more came out of nowhere and now for the first time he was in a one against four fight P. To say he was nervous was an understatement. I am gonna die. There is no way I get out of this. Holy fuck. Calm your bitch ass down and focus maybe I can get away. Okay 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 I got this when one of the villain's shorts fire out of his mouth at Izuku Izuku knew he was done. Never mind I am dead. I am just gonna accept my fate. Izuku got out of his fighting pose and shrugged. The drug dealers were taken aback and were very confused. Izuku using this to his advantage swung his fully built bow staff and hit one of the thugs across the face. Fuck yeah, take that bitch. He completely misjudged the reaction this would get because they all charged him at one and he did not have enough time nor experience to stop them. One thigh grabbed each of his arms and the third punched him in the face while he was held down by the others. He got his in the face again and then the stomach which made him try to curl up. As the guy went for another punch a grey material wrapped around his elbow and then the guy was being turned around. Izuku hadn't noticed homeless hero enter the scene he also hadn't seen him take out the fourth guy. With the villains holding him distracted he slipped from their grasp. He fell to the ground and before he could be grabbed again he ran over to Gan then up the fire escape. He knew homeless hero could take care of himself so he ran as fast as he could away from there. Izuku knew that what he was doing was technically illegal and was vigilante work. He also knew he would and could be arrested for it so he decided not to take the chance and run away and hide. He decided he was done for the night. His head was pounding and he didn't want to be caught by homeless hero. When he woke up in the morning his head was still pounding. Fuck he hit me harder than I thought. Izuku pulled up the jacket he had stolen to look at his stomach where he had been hit. There was a pretty bad bruise where the fist had connected. Groaning he decided he should get up. Since he has been in the same alley for a while and people know he will fight for his stuff no one bothers his things and none of it gets stolen. Some of his first real fights happened while he was trying to protect his alley. He has scars from fighting off a woman with a knife. Izuku had started taking money from the villains he took down so he had some money now and didn't have to be skimpy with it as much. Only problem, most stores didn't let him in since he looked homeless and would chase away customers. There were very few stores that would let him in. An even bigger problem was the places he dumpster dived had started locking up their dumpsters to keep him out of them. So he wasn't eating nearly as much as he should. It had been taking a toll on him. He was losing weight and muscle. He had to find a way to get food in quick. He decided it might help if he didn't look homeless so he went into one of the stores that did let him in and bought real shampoo scissors and body soap. Before this he had just used the soap from the soap to send her in the public bathroom since he didn't have a need but now he did have a need. He snuck into a gym locker room and took a real shower in there and cut his hair evenly so it looked better. His hair now sat with a grown out undercut look. He smelled good and looked good. He left and went to the closest laundromat where he took some freshly clean clothes from someone's basket. He got into his getup. He was able to walk into any store he wanted because he looked put together enough. He went around and bought all the things he had been needing and stocked up on food. But this problem temporarily solved he was ready for patrol when it was time. I wonder if homeless hero knows I am a vigilante. I really hope he thought I was some kid getting beat up and not a crime fighting badass like I am. Maybe I should take a few days off to let it cool down. I have been careful to avoid him and even stay out of his patrol area so why was he there? Maybe he switched to there. Whatever I am gonna go on patrol. He went to the public bathrooms and grabbed his gear from the loose ceiling tile above the handicapped stall. He got changed and put his usual clothes up there. Like a switch had been flipped the second he left the bathroom he became his numb robotic vigilante persona. 
While he was patrolling he noticed he was being watched and kept feeling that way. He took care to try to loose the eyes but he didn't loose them. At some points he swore he saw something moving in the corner of his eye. This all made him really paranoid so much so he messed up in fighting and had taken a few hard hits. He decided to try to double back and see if he could catch whatever was watching him. He jumped down into an alley and hid in the trash that was around the dumpster he made it so he could see if someone dropped down. A minute later a racer had dropped down into the alley. He looked around and then walked out. What? The? Actual? Fuck was that? I am being hustled by a pro hero. I guess I am gonna have to be more careful or change where I patrol. After a few minutes he got up from his spot and went back home deciding that was enough for the night. The next night he went to a completely different route and didn't have a problem he was able to do this for about a week or two until again he felt eyes on him. He kept doing this changing his ruffie in a different part and it would be fine for a week or two and then again he would feel the eye on him. Fuck. Why won't this bastard leave me alone? Izuku thought frustratedly he was back to his original route and again the eyes were there. Doesn't he have anything better to do than follow me? He should be stopping crime not following me. I am having to pick up his slack. Either I keep going and ignore him or I don't patrol for a while. Wait I am so stupid. He has been finding me cause I portos the same route every night for like a week. New idea. I am gonna change it every night and make sure it's not predictable. Every night he went a different route in a different area and he didn't feel the eyes on him until a month later when they came back. Since the call he had been asking different informants about the Kidlante. He wanted to know if there was an reported quirk, where he patrolled pretty much anything he could. From what he had heard people did not want this kid arrested. Cherub was helping people and stopping crime that he could get to. He honestly kinda agreed. He didn't think it should be up to the kid to take up the responsibility since it was dangerous but he did agree that he was helping. The red light district had become safer since his arrival. The part Aizawa found funny was the kid was rumored for being ruthless in a fight and doing anything to win but was named after an angel. Once he had a basic idea of where the vigilante pothole he started going around there to learn the area a bit in case he was chasing the kid. He knew he wanted to try to earn the kid's trust and try to talk him out of being a vigilante before he would forcefully take him in. Once night that he was checking out the area he heard some suspicious noises coming from an alley a few alleys away. It was lucky he heard B3 cause it was pretty quiet. He ran over and peeked over. He saw what he almost immediately recognized as Green Cherub staring down a group of four thugs. The racer had decided to watch and see what happened. He saw the kid look between the four and then drop his stance and shrug at the villains. They were obviously caught off guard by this and seemed to look at each other ask what to do dot when all of a sudden the kid swung the bow staff he had in his hand and walked the closest villain across the face with it. The racer had had to stifle a laugh at that. But it seemed to have backfired as the three left charged the kid leaving the fourth clutching his face. They grabbed the kid by his arms and started beating him. He decided this was his time to step in. He took out the fourth person before catching the puncher's arm he took him out and while he was doing this he saw the kid escape. He took care of the thugs then tried to follow but it was too late the kid was gone. The next night he followed the kid from a distance. He could tell the kid knew because he kept looking around and Eraserhead had had to keep ducking to try to stay out of sight. He got to see the kid fight and he wasn't too impressed. He was sloppy and distracted. While he was following the kid he all of a sudden dropped into an alley after a bit he dropped in after him to follow but the kid was gone. The kid wasn't there the next night and he couldn't find him so he asked around until he found out where the kid was. He would survey the area and then follow the kid again. It took him about a week each time to find the kid but he was predictable so it wasn't too hard. He was following the kid cause he wanted to find more out and he was trying to get closer. But the kid somehow always kept distance between them. One night the kid completely disappeared and Eraserhead couldn't find him. From his informants in the red light district he found out the kid was changing his route every day. Eraserhead tried to find a pattern but he couldn't. He did the same thing of scrambling his patrol routes to see if he could find the kid and one night he did. This time though it wasn't the kid that needed help. Chapter 9 Heroes Need Rescuing Summary We meet the Yamaha Aizawa family. They be not a great thing. Also Izuku weighs back Aizawa. Trigger warning. V-O-I-L-E-N-C-E and Gore. Notes. Chapter Text Eraserhead was following Chera when he heard something in an alley so he went over and tried to see what was going on. What he should have heard but didn't was the person who came up behind him and pushed him. He tried to catch himself but it was too late. He crashed into the alley. Luckily the building wasn't big. He had done his best to keep damage off himself but he couldn't move. The air was gone from him and his whole body was shaking. Three guys came out of seemingly nowhere laughing. Or at least Eraserhead thinks they were laughing he couldn't hear. A fourth comes around the building the one he thinks pushed him. Damn it I got ambushed his hearing started to come back and he felt like he could move but he stayed where he was he wanted to see what he could learn while they weren't trying to fight him. That was a whole lot easier than I thought it would be. He didn't even see it coming. Pro hero my ass. The seeming leader laughed. This is for ruining my turf. Now I can't do my job and you are what's stopping it. 
The guy says this as goes to kick Eraserhead. He just barely is able to guard himself from the kick. He staggers up and gets into fighting position. His right side that took most of the fall is throbbing and he is pretty sure a rib is broken he is also pretty sure his collarbone is broken too. He does his best to keep a good stance as the first guy comes towards him. He quickly takes care of him. The next comes towards him and tries to get him what he missed was that the sneaky guy had gotten behind him and while he was focused on the lizard guy coming at him the stealth guy grabbed him. While he is trying to fight a sharp pain spreads in his abdomen he looks down to he there is a knife sticking out of him. This causes him to pause for a second giving the stealth guy holding him the upper hand. He has a racer head with another knife to his throat as he is keeping his hands behind him. There are black dots in his eyes as he tries to focus. Focus, I need to get home to Azashi and Hitoshi I can't leave them. I need to fight. Fuck this hurts his vision blurs. He can't make out what the leader is saying. He takes another throwing knife from god knows where and stabs it through a racer head thigh. The racer head grimaces but refuses to pass out. I am sorry Hizashi. I am sorry Hitoshi he looks the leader in the eye then kicks his foot up hitting the guy in the gut making him double over. The knife tightens around his throat. A racer head puts his head forward a bit then drives it back hitting the stealthy guy in the nose. The guy drops the knife in favor of cradling his broken nose. A punch to a racer head face send him against the alley. This usually wouldn't happen but he is really out of it. His vision blocks out for a second and he staggers. He can't fight anymore and he knows it. He starts to slide down the wall. Everything blurry, leader on his face, head throbbing. The stealth guy goes down next. He blacks out, a masked figure above him. What? Green? Kid? Angel? He blacks out. He was sitting on a roof looking over the city when he hears a crash behind him. He looks in that direction. A few building away he sees a man standing on a roof and then climb down what he thinks is some sort of fire escape. That's not suspicious at all. He moved in that direction and stopped at the other side of the building listening from afar. He heard Maniac laughing. Villains actually do that. Then he heard some grunts and clattering he decided to go over and look. Eraser head was punched across the face and had stumbled over to the alley wall. What is wrong with him? He can take this so why is he so out of it? Whatever I need to help him. He assessed the situation and was going to wait a bit longer but then saw Eraser head slump. One of the thugs were headed towards him with a knife. Izuku rushed in. He jumped on the thug's head taking him out then went to next closest which was a guy holding his nose. He hit the guy in the back of the neck with his bow staff the guy fell past out. The third guy cowered in the corner Izuku walked up to him then hit the guy's head against the brick wall of the alley making pass out. He ran over to a racer head assessing the damage. There were two knives sticking out of him one in his abdomen right under the last rib and the other was lodged in his thigh. His right arm was hanging weirdly. There was blood on the right side of a racer head face. He was clutching his ribs with his left hand. A racer head slowly blinked at Izuku. Kid. Izuku not really knowing how to help took out his phone and called 911 and asked for an ambulance to their location. The racer head looked out of it completely. Izuku decided he would see what first aid he could do to help the ambulance. He took off a racer head capture weapon and with it he grimaced. It was clear that his right arm was hanging weird because of his broken collarbone. He could see it through his skin. He gagged. Moving on to the next thing he took off a racer head goggles and mobbed his hair to show a bleeding gash on his forehead. Izuku used the glue in his first aid kit to glue it shut. He used his hoodie sleeve to wipe off as much blood off Eraserhead's face as he could. He glued the cut on Eraserhead's throat shut. He then ripped some of his hoodie off and tied it around the knife in Eraserhead's abdomen. He was hoping it would help stop the blood slipping around the knife. He knew not to take the knife out. He then used his duct tape to make a tourniquet of sorts to stop blood loss from his leg. His ashy dot 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 coal the rest of his sentence died off. Izuku was confused. Who was his ashy? Izuku searched Eraserhead's pockets till he found his phone. He used Eraserhead's thumbprint to open it. He went through the contacts until he saw the name. He hit call. Two rings. Are you okay? You never call when on patrol. Izuku was stuck as the panicked man's voice came through the phone. Oh H hey. I have Eraserhead's phone. He is badly injured I called an ambulance and they should be here any second. Who is this? What happened to him? H flinched as the voice got louder and more panicked. The ambulance was practically outside the alley so he said. The ambulance is here I am leaving out on so you can talk to the paramedics. I have to go. He watched as the paramedics jumped out and started running towards him. He handed a confused paramedic Eraserhead's phone then left as fast as he could. He was woken up by his phone ringing. He had accidentally fallen asleep with his hearing aids again. He looked at the contact and quickly answered. His blood ran cold when he wasn't answered. A child's voice came over the phone and talked to him. His ashy jumped up and started to get dressed. He didn't realize he was using his quirk until his son Hitoshi ran into his room looking worried. He took the phone away from his face for a second. Get dressed we are going to the hospital Hitoshi nodded then ran out of the room. 
All of a sudden he was talking to a paramedic over the phone telling them his husband's blood type and any other information they asked. If they are asking for blood type then this is bad he thought as he and Hitoshi jumped into his car. The paramedic told him the hospital they were going to then hung up the phone. What's going on Papa? Is dad alright? Hitoshi asked from passenger seat. I am not sure. They arrived at the hospital and ran up to the main desk. Shota Aizawa. Hazashi pretty much yelled at the receptionist. She slowly started typing Hazashi grew impatient. He is currently in surgery and should be out in a few hours. Please take a seat. Hazashi and Hitoshi took a seat and waited it felt like time wasn't moving. Finally a doctor came out and called. Shota Aizawa. They got up quickly and walked over. How is he? Hazashi asked trying not to sound scraped in front of his son. He is stable and is doing great. He had two broken ribs, a broken collarbone a chip and his cheekbone. The seas have been set correctly and with another session of healing should be all set. The thing we were worried about was he was stabbed twice once in the abdomen and the other in his thigh. He had other minor cuts. He also has a concussion and will need to stay in a quiet dark environment for a day or two while we heal him. He was really lucky the knife didn't take out and major organs though we did have to heal quite a lot. His thigh should be perfectly fine. If it wasn't for that vigilante your husband wouldn't have made it. He glued shut the smaller cuts and blocked the abdomen bleeding and even tied a tourniquet around his leg. He is in room 235 you are free to go see him. He probably won't wake up for an hour or two. Hazashi sighed with relief hearing the good news and the second he was told what room to go to him and Hitoshi went there. When they got to the dark room Aizawa say there with a bandage over his forehead and one on his throat. He looked peaceful laying there. Hitoshi and Hazashi pulled up chairs to the bed and held his hand. Hitoshi fell asleep after an hour of waiting. Hazashi was about to fall asleep himself when he saw his husband's eyes flutter open. Don't you ever do that to me again. Hazashi whisper yelled at his husband as tears slipped from his eyes. I'm sorry, was all he could say. Hitoshi woke up and got mad that they hadn't woken him up, and then asked, Did you at least beat up the villains that did this to you? Aizawa had a focused face as he was trying to think about what happened. Sorry but no. That new vigilante I told you about saved me. Really? Yup. Did you know he called me? Hazashi asked. He did. Yes he called me on your phone and said you had told him to call him. I don't remember that. Huh. I am happy he did call me. Dad the doctor said he saved your life. He did first aid on your and stopped the bleeding. Of course the doctor saved me. No dad, the vigilante saved you. I guess he really is a green cherub, Hazashi said. I wonder if Eraserhead is okay. He probably is since he is a hero. Izuku was sitting on the roof adjacent to his spot as he looked over the city. He was wrapped in his blanket trying to see the stars. Chapter 10 It's all fun and games until it's not. Summary Izuku has major trust issues as this chapter shows and costs might be after him. Notes. Chapter Text. Izuku hoped Eraserhead would leave him alone now but knowing his luck he wouldn't. And as if on cue a week later he felt the eyes again. Why won't he just leave me alone? What did I do? One thing that steadily was happening was every time Eraserhead found him he would get closer. Izuku was not about to get arrested because then he would be sent back to the foster system and he couldn't handle that again. He shivered at the thought of going back. He would fight tooth and nail to stay. He also researched it and found something funny. He was technically not really a vigilante since he doesn't have a quirk. He can get in trouble for the assault though. Stupid Eraserhead had figured out how to almost always find him. How you may ask. Because most of his routes overlapped in one area so Eraserhead kinda just kept checking that until he saw him. He decided he would have to change his routes. He didn't even realize they did that. He even realized what buildings seemed to cross between most of the routes. Let's turning off the tables. The mess by on him tonight. Take that bitch. Before it go to dark he went to the building then went to building over. He hid behind an air conditioner unit he huddled so he should be hidden behind it and he waited for the hero to show up. About an hour and he saw the homeless hero and watched as the man hid himself and waiting a for a long time then came out again. He set a cooler by his hiding spot then ran off. When Izuku was sure he was gone he went over to the building and looked at the cooler. He circled it then looked around to see if it was a trap then with his bow staff he flipped the top of the cooler and peered inside. There was a colorful bento box in there and a black envelope. He slowly approached the cooler while having constantly looking up and around. He picked up the bento box and opened it. It had on a jiri, fried fish and some pickled veggies on the side. Izuku's mouth watered looking at this. When was the last time he had an actual home-cooked meal? When was the last time he ate something that wasn't out of a can or dumpster? He wanted to eat it but he didn't know if it was lace so he closed it and put it back. He then looked at the envelope it was addressed to Green Chera. He knew the locals called him this but it was weird knowing the hero knew that. He opened the envelope. Hello Green Cherub. I want to thank you for saving my life a few weeks ago. The doctor said that if it wasn't for your quick thinking I would have died. I noticed you never stopped to eat so I made something for your patrol today. I have been trying to give you a lunch but I can't seem to get close enough. I want you to know that I am trying to turn you in. 
I want to make sure you are safe and healthy. I will leave a bento in this cooler very night you can eat them if you want. Also here is my number if you are ever in trouble. 30 to 30. Hazashi also wanted me to thank you for him. He is very thankful that you got me home to him. I will stop following you. Thank you, Eraserhead. Izuku had to read the letter twice to actually believe what he was seeing. Eraserhead the homeless looking guy who always seems to be grumpy wrote him a personal handwritten letter. I don't believe this it's a trap. Fuck whoever did this. He threw the envelope into the cooler and went off to take down villains. Izuku was looking for pencils in a school supply stood so he could write more notes but he wasn't finding any. He had looked everywhere. When he went over again something caught his eye. A big green sparkly sharpie marker. He walked out of the store making a good purchase. He did not find the pencils. When criminals started being picked up with a green sparkly GC written on their cheek with fancy handwriting let's just say the police were amused. They were even more amused when it didn't come off for a while. Izuku had gotten in a rhythm of taking down villains his favorite part was putting his signature on their face. It was something fun to add. He was now able to take three people on at once he had been working on groups. It's been two weeks since the cooler thing and since then homeless hero hadn't followed him for a bit. Izuku had started doing a different route every night so he had more influence over a larger area, which actually brought down crime rates. There were rumors about Green Cherub being absolutely ruthless and willing to kill someone to win which was mostly untrue. He wasn't trying to kill anyone and he didn't plan to but if he hit someone really hard, that wasn't his fault the guy should have chosen a better career. One night curiosity got the better of him and he went to check if there really was a new bento in the cooler. There was a new bento and the letter still sat there. He huffed and stomped off. Why was he being nice? He wouldn't be nice if he knew. Why is he pretending to care? Izuku was woken up rudely by someone knocking on the dumpster that sheltered Izuku. He grabbed his knife and looked out of his little hole. There was a man with a yellow mask and locks for earrings stood impatiently waiting for Izuku to show himself. Izuku was 95% sure this was one of the newer heroes Rock Lock. He poked his face out glaring at the hero, suspected Rock Lock side and then said, I was told to clear out the homeless from this street since you guys are causing problems. I need you to vacate the area in the next half hour, otherwise we will be arresting you for loitering. He said all of this while trying to look intimidating. If he wanted to play the intimidation game then fine he will play. He got up and stood in front of the hero. He glared up at the hero through his eyebrows. He tried to make himself look bigger but there wasn't much he could do. Hey look these aren't my orders. These are the landlords whose alley you are in. If you have a problem then take it up with him. If you fight me I will have to arrest you and all of your stuff will be taken to a dump. If I were you I would pack up and get out of here, he said in a calm voice. Izuku knew there wasn't really anything he could do and he couldn't get arrested so with one last angry look he went into this little home and started putting everything he could fit in his bag. He was going to have to start this whole thing over again. And depending on how many people are kicked out he is going to have to fight for a spot again. His bag was almost exploding with everything he had stuffed into it. He needed to be able to carry whatever he was bringing so he put on all his clothes at once. Most of the clothes were oversized because it made him look bigger. Everything he couldn't wear he put into the bag. He threw the bag on his back then grabbed whatever else he could carry in his arms while still being able to fight if he needed. He stepped out of his home for the last year and a quarter. He turned around to face it and say goodbye when he heard it. Hey there is a kid out here who looks about 11. What should I do? Okay I will try. Rock Lock was talking on the phone a little down the street. If it wasn't for doing vigilante training he wouldn't have heard it. Tim and Rock Lock made eye contact at the same time. Izuku bolted. He ran as fast as he could away from there. He could hear Rock Lock behind him. But Izuku wasn't hopeless. He dropped everything in his arms. The clothes he had been using to insulate his home wrapped around Rock Lock's legs and took him down. Izuku ran as fast and as far as he could. He took many different paths and even at one point went onto the roofs and ran that way. He ran until he felt safe. He looked around he knew where he was but he didn't like where he was. He was now deeper into the red light district than he would like. It was getting dark and he couldn't risk going back right then. He couldn't leave where he was. No patrol for a while I guess he didn't want to be in an alley so he searched until he found a good roof that had a little shelter. He took all the extra clothes and took off his bag pack. His clothes were drenched in sweat from running so much. He took the two cans he had out of his bag and ate both for dinner. He had to keep his muscle up. When he found a spot he would restock but he didn't want to travel with a lot of soup cans in his bag because it would slow him down. He started searching his bag for the blanket his money was wrapped in. He had put it in a blanket to keep it dry and it hid it. He needed to count how much he had so he knew what he could buy. It wasn't in his bag. It wasn't in his clothes. It was missing. No, it was with the insulation he had thrown at Rock Lock. How stupid could he be? He banged his fist on the concrete roof. He was in an area where he didn't have any respect. He didn't have any money. He didn't know what dumpsters were whose. He had no way to eat. He fucked up. 
Chapter 11, Maybe a Little Hope. Summary, Aizawa's side explained and we get more Izuku. Notes, Chapter Text. While Aizawa was healing in the hospital he had a lot of time to think about what had happened and to think about Green Cherub. He had to find a way to bet the kid to trust him he wanted to also thank the kid for saving him. So did his Ashi. He decided that his first mission when he was back on patrol was to find and thank Cherub. He had been looking at Cherub's routes and found a similarity. Most of his routes passed by this one area. If he stayed around the area long enough he could see the kid crossing rooftops. He had been trying to get closer but he always lost the kid once he got closer than three buildings. He wondered if that was Cherub's quirk. He had to come up with something else. One day while he was waiting out of sight for Cherub came to him. When he never saw Cherub stop to eat. He was out here for around six hours and never ate anything. This worried him. Two Cherub wouldn't let him talk to him so he would have to leave and not. He had an idea. He talked to Hazashi who loved the idea. He said he would make the food. He said he had one condition. Hazashi had to proofread the note Aizawa was writing to make sure it was good. With that agreed they set it all up. Hazashi did have a lot to fix of Aizawa's note. Apparently hey here is some food and number. I am not trying to arrest you. Also thank you for getting me help wasn't enough. That night he put a few ice packs in the cooler then set the bento box in it. He put the note on top of the bento so it would stay dry. He wanted Cherub to see him put it down so he sat by and waited for Cherub to go by the building. He had been so focused on looking for a Cherub he didn't realize he felt like he was being watched. When it had been too long he walked out and put the cooler in the middle of the roof before leaving. He was going to stay nearby. A few roofs over he watched as Cherub made his way over and inspected the cooler. He almost laughed at this because it was actually kinda cute. He did laugh when the kid flipped the cooler open with his bow staff. But it did open his eyes to how little Cherub trusted him. He watched the kid open up the bento put it back in then read the card. He would be lying if he said he was surprised that Cherub didn't take the food. Every night he swung by and put in a new bento and replacing the ice packs he always left the letter in there just in case. He took the uneaten food as a good sign that Cherub was well fed. Hazashi every morning looked exciting waiting to see if the kid had eaten his food and always was disappointed when the kid had not eaten the food. When he got called to the police station he was confused. When he walked in he saw the officers laughing while looking into the holding cell. He walked over to see why. He had to hide a smirk when he saw the GC signature on all of the criminals in the cell. Niyamasa walked out of his office and walked up to Aizawa. Like what the kid has started doing, he asked but then moved on without waiting for a response from the hero. I got a call from a landlord that he was tired of the homeless on his street so either we take care of it or he will. I was wondering if you were willing to take care of that. It will take place tomorrow. No I won't. Those homeless people probably haven't been doing anything wrong, Aizawa answered. He hated the hate for the homeless people forget they are people too. Well it's either you are a newer hero. The one we are gonna send in is Rock Lock. I will go to supervise to make sure they are treated somewhat nicely. Aizawa grumbles as he walks out of the station. He gets a text on his phone from Naomasa with the time and address. He shows up in costume and introduces himself to Rock Lock. They work their way down the street. He lets Rock Lock deliver the news. At some point Aizawa goes to help a lady fill her cart with her stuff. To say he was surprised when a kid ran past him with then Rock Lock chasing him would be an understatement. Why was he chasing the kid? He stopped helping the lady in favor of supervising unit Rock Lock came back. When the other hero came back Aizawa gave him a questioning look. The kid is homeless so I called my agency to ask what I should do and they said keep him here until CPS gets here but he must have heard me because as I turned to get him he runs off. Rock Lock answered unhappily. Aizawa nods and thinks. He gestured for the woman he was helping come over. When she got over to them he asked, what's the kid's name that lives in that alley? He points Tati Ally he thinks he saw Rock Lock enter last. She shrugs and explains, no one knows. He never really talked to anyone. He kept to himself and was only there to sleep. He don't know where he went the rest of the time. Thank you. The woman walks away to get her and her stuff out of here. I guess you are going to have to hunt for him, Aizawa says to Rock Lock. When everyone was cleared out Eraserhead nodded to Rock Lock before leaving. It had been a while since he saw Green Cherub. No one had seen the kid. He would usually see glimpses of the kid or hear that he had turned someone in from Naomasa but there was nothing. Complete radio silence. He hoped that Green Cherub had decided to stop Vigilantying but he guessed he hadn't. Eraserhead found himself looking in every alley he could. What was he looking for? Really in sign of the kid. He was really hoping he didn't find a dead kid. It has been almost two weeks and there is no word on the kid. This is getting worrying. Eraserhead had continued replacing food and at this point Hazashi didn't have hope that the food would be eaten. One night on the two and a half week marker of radio silence from Green Cherub he opened the cooler to an empty bento box. I really hope this is Cherub and not some rando who found this and decided to eat it. Izuku was tired. Like really tired. It had been a few days and he had been searching for a spot to settle in but it seemed all the alleys were already claimed. 
His only choices were to move somewhere completely different or fight and steal an alley. He didn't want to go back up to the richer part because it was likely they would push him back further. He had to get a set spot that he wouldn't give up. He searched and searched until he found a good alley. It already had some cardboard boxes and other junk. He sat above for a day or two to see if anyone lived there and no one did so he dropped down and started setting up. It was a dead end so there was only one way someone could come to attack him from the street. In the back corner he made himself a little shelter. It wasn't very good at the moment but he wasn't going to make it great until the spot was his and until he earned enough respect to hold the spot. Over a year in something that he had been homeless he found out how important respect was and that everyone had turf. Izuku fought for his right to his old alley and had gotten enough respect to be left alone. He claimed the dumpsters he dumpster dived in. He wouldn't have cared if someone else used the dumpster he did but in the homeless world if you fight for it and win it's here. This rule applied to local gangs and drug dealers. If there was a homeless person in the alley they didn't deal there or fight there. In that same way no homeless person lived in the alleys the gangs and drug dealers had claimed. Izuku didn't know who owned this alley and he honestly wasn't excited to find out but it helped that he already knew the rules. To get this alley to himself he would have to fight and not leave it for a bit. Izuku barely slept the first night. He had a knife under his pillow. He wished he had his vigilante gear but it was still in the park's public bathrooms in the ceiling. He couldn't go back there for a bit until he was sure Rock Lock gave up. He also couldn't leave until this was his. During the day he tried to stay alert but was really tired because of the lack of sleep. He did end up falling asleep for a bit. He woke up to someone standing outside the alley looking at him. He stood up trying to look bigger than he was. He tried to be intimidating. The guy humphed and then walked away. That night was hell. He was ready when they came. Two men and a girl tried to sneak up on him but Izuku knew they were coming. He jumped up knife out. The fight lasted longer than Izuku wanted it to. He ended up winning. He had bruises all over his body and some claw slashes from the lady's quirk. He slumped down on his makeshift mattress and waited. This was the first of many fights. A few days later and Izuku had won his spot. He had to fight off a small gang and some homeless people who tried to challenge him. He didn't come out of this unharmed. He had a bunch of new scars to add to the collection. His cheek had a slash down it and his left eyebrow to mid-forehead had a cut. Both of them he knew would scar. He had slashed all over his body some from knives and others from a lady with some sort of claw mutation. He was covered in scrapes bumps and bruises otherwise. While gangs fight with precision homeless people fight to survive. Izuku still had no food. He hadn't been able to leave for more than a little bit. He was banking on the money to save him since there is always a convenience store around. He had eaten his last food a while ago because he thought he had money. There were no soup kitchens nearby. He hadn't eaten in a few days and that was probably the reason he was so beat up. If he was eating his usual amount he could have taken on those people easily but without food. It was a lot harder. He was starving his stomach hurt. He didn't know what to do. I wonder if that bento box is still there. No, I will not eat that food it's probably laced. But what if it wasn't? He was really too hungry to care. The bento building was about a mile by street but three divided by four seconds a mile by roof. He decided he would be quick and only leave for a little just to eat the bento and that was it. He climbed up and started heading there at a jog. It was a lot harder to do this covered in open wounds and starving. He got there and tentatively opened the cooler. There was the bento box. Fuck it. Either die eating food or die from not eating. He stuffed his face and he had never tasted some so good in his life. He ate so fast the food was gone in seemingly seconds. Izuku was embarrassed in himself but then realized it's dumb to be. He put the bento box back and headed back. Stomach not so empty and maybe a little more hope. Chapter 12 The It's Bitsy Spider Summary Izuku and Eraserhead get closer. Eraserhead finds some stuff out about Green Cherub. Trigger warning. Violence. Notes. Chapter text. Every few days he would go eat the bento but he didn't want to get reliant on the bentos. He started exploring more to see what was around and maybe see if he could find a public bathroom nearby. He missed his old spot. It was reliable and he didn't have to work hard to get things done. If he was correct about where he was he was three miles away from his old spot. He needed to get his gear. It had been two weeks since the a month since he had patrolled and a month since the rock lock incident so it should be fine right. He decided it was time to get his stuff. He had heard that villains thought he was dead so the crime rate was back up. He also had heard that Eraserhead was looking for him. He got up that morning and went back to his old spot. He brought his bag with him to see if he could revisit his old dumpsters to get food. He visited them to find they had been unlocked since he hadn't been there. He filled up on anything he could eat and wasn't too far gone. In the bathroom he stood on the toilet and reached into the ceiling. He grabbed the bag that was thankfully still there. He pulled it down almost coughing at the amount of dust and insulation that came with it. Carrying the bag he started heading back. He hadn't found anywhere to change so he would have to change in the open or in his little hut of cardboard. He was not excited about this one bit. It felt freeing to climb back up onto the roofs and be able to run wherever he wanted. He had kept training as much as he could while he was stuck. 
He knew he would be rusty so he decided to ease into it. As he was running and jumped a particularly big gap he winces as his clothes snagged on the scabbed over slash marks on his back. His face hadn't quite healed all the way either so when he grimaced it stretched the cut on his cheek. I fucking hate this. These need to heal faster damn it. He kept going trying to ignore the stinging pain as the athletic underclothes rubbed and snagged on his scars and scabs. He forgot how gross feeling it was. The athletic material was made of a different kind of fabric than all his other clothes so this only happened with these legging-like pants and long sleeve shirt. He was only able to take down a few muggers before he was bone tired. He hadn't been eating nearly enough and had lost a lot of weight because of that. He was smaller so it took more and longer to take down villains. He would have to find a way to start eating more. His patrols for the next few days continued like this. He did end up eating two more bento boxes and he finally had found a dumpster that he could claim. He did have to scare someone off for it. He was starting to be able to eat more and it helped but it still wasn't enough. He had to resort to using the last parts of his patrol to swinging by his home and grabbing his bag to go dumpster dive in his old dumpsters. He had started pickpocketing again and stealing money from the villains he took down. Soon enough he had enough money to start buying non-perishables. This all helped him and finally he started to gain weight again. He started having an easier time on patrols and was able to take down more people. One night on patrol he felt eyes on him. He knew it was a racer hat. He would be lying if he said that it surprised him that a racer had found him. He was probably checking that it really was Cherub and not a copycat. He was thankful for a racer head in some ways but didn't mean he liked or trusted him. The racer head probably saved him with the bento boxes. He did want to thank him but wasn't sure how. He didn't want to get close to the hero but wanted to show his appreciation. He did really like the bento boxes they were really yummy and it was nice to have something different than canned or dumpster food. He decided to do what the hero had done and leave a note. That day he wrote his thanks on a piece of notebook paper then went to the cooler and put it on top of the letter that the hero had left for him. He was nervous but decided there was no point to be. He went home to sleep and make sure no one tried to steal his spot. When he heard from both Naamasa and from the locals that Green Cherub was back he was relieved it had been about a month since he had seen the kid. Every few days a bento would be eaten and that was a good sign. Hazashi was happy so he was happy. He was a little suspicious that it really was Cherub so he searched until he saw the kid. It was him. He was relieved the kid was okay but was worried. What made him take a month-long break? One night when he went to go replace the bento he saw a note on top. He picked it up and read it. Thanks for the bentos. GC. He laughed at the short message. What else did he expect from the vigilante? He knew it was the kid because the note was written in his signature green sparkly marker and fancy handwriting. He took a picture of the note and sent it to his family's group chat. Putting the note back into the cooler he went on his patrol. After that night notes through the cooler became more normal. It was a safe way to communicate. Most of the notes from Green Cherub were the location of bigger groups that he couldn't take down. One time it was a spot where trafficked women were taken to sit before they were shipped out. Aizawa quickly learned that the kid knew a lot about the red light district and its works. This worried Aizawa but it helped take down the crime rate. One night while Aizawa was heading to the cooler he saw Green Cherub already there. He was grabbing the bento. This stopped Eraserhead from continuing his pace opting to take a walk around the block until Cherub was gone. He didn't want to scare the kid and he wanted the kid to feel safe coming up to him. Landing on the same roof as him while he was eating was not the way to do it. He saw the kid sit crisscross on the ground and eat the food. He was too far away to see his food but he saw him pull down his mask. What worried Aizawa was the fact that the kid pretty much inhaled his food like he was either really hungry or expected it to disappear if he didn't eat it in 5 seconds. When the kid was gone he went up to the cooler to replace the bento. Since he had gotten his strength back he had been taking down bigger targets. He knew his limit but still wanted those people taken down. He knew he couldn't do it by himself so he had started leaving notes in the cooler. Every time it would be taken seriously. And the problem would be taken care of. He was surprised Eraser had listened and tried. He heard most of his info from was dropping on villains before taking them down or from the locals. Most seemed to think the homeless were deaf or just didn't care. One night on patrol he was listening in on a group of four when they spotted him. One of them caught him with some sort of invisible bubble. He was floated down into the alley. The bubble popped as his feet hit the ground. Izuku immediately got into fighting position and picked out the biggest threat to him which was the bubble guy. He put his bow staff together quickly then used it like a bat to take out the bubble guy. He turned to the next biggest guy but Cherub was thrown to the wall by one of the smaller men with what seemed to be spider wet. Now looking at the guy he saw the extra eyes and the fangs. Are you joking? He couldn't reach any of his weapons and was stuck in the web. What should we do with this party crashed? One guy asked the other. I think we should teach him a lesson about eavesdropping. They started coming towards him. I knew a racer head was nearby I really hope he hears this and gets here before I die. I can't move this sucks. What is this ma? His thoughts were interrupted by his head hitting the concrete wall of the alley. His head erupted with pain. 
Then like he had hoped the villains started falling. Izuku was still seeing stars from the head bump but he did make out Eraserhead's red glowing eyes as he took down the thugs. Thank you Eraserhead. Guess something good did come out or your stalker tendencies. He smiled at his own joke. Something is wrong. Everything is kinda fuzzy. I kinda like think. Everything didn't seem as scary. His head wasn't working correctly. He watched Eraserhead tie up the villains then it hit him. Fuck. I am stuck in this stupid web I can't get away. I am an illegal crime fighting badass that just got caught. Well I guess I'm not that badass since I had to be saved. Eraser had approached the stuck vigilante. Izuku could see the hero's shoulders shaking from what he guessed was the hero holding in his laughter. Before the her got to close he stopped and crossed his arms looking at the caught kid. It took you being stuck like a fly in a spider web to have an actual conversation. Before I cut you down I want you to know I am not gonna arrest you or hurt you. I am going to treat you as a victim of crime. I would like to look you over for injuries. Izuku couldn't respond. He didn't trust Aizawa enough to talk. He also hadn't talked since he saved Eraserhead. He didn't even know if his voice worked. He would use sign language but he couldn't move his hands enough to do that. He decided just to nod. Are you going to hurt me? When I let you down and then run off. Izuku thought about it. If he made Eraserhead slightly injured then he couldn't follow him when he ran away. But he didn't think Eraserhead would let him down if he didn't say no. He could lie and run but with the way his head was spinning and the want to throw up he guessed that he wouldn't be able to run so he begrudgingly shook his head. Eraserhead smirked and then took out a knife from his belt and started cutting Izuku off the wall. When there was enough give he helped Izuku to get off the wall. When Izuku was on his feet he swayed for a second then decided he needed to sit down. He sat down against the wall while trying to keep an eye on Eraserhead. Once down he didn't like that he was at a disadvantage so he took out his own knife and kept it in his hand while also letting Eraserhead see it so the hero knew that he would fight if he had to. Don't worry kid I am not gonna hurt you. If it makes you feel better. Eraserhead took off his capture weapon on the ground then walked a few feet from it and sat down cross cross. He had also put his knife in the bundle of scarf. He pushed up his goggles. Eraserhead looked him in the eye as if he was expecting something. If he expects me to put my knife down he is insane. Izuku shook his head. His head pounded a little harder when he did it. Hey I put my weapons away so you would feel more comfortable now it's your turn to put your weapons away so I don't have to be nervous. He was being fair. But the world hadn't been fair to him so why should he listen? Also Eraserhead is a trained fighter and I am self-taught. He shook his head again. His head pounding harder. He gripped his knife. Are you not gonna talk? I can understand not wanting to but I am not gonna turn you in or hurt you. Izuku decided he wasn't gonna make his head anymore so he put the knife on his lap lifted his hands and signed. Uh, good thing I know sign language then. This surprised Izuku. Most people didn't know sign language. Izuku said. Eraser had answered in sign language. Izuku was hesitant to answer but decided there wasn't harm in answering. Izuku didn't like the idea of it because then it would be showing his weaknesses. But he realized that if Eraserhead was gonna arrest him he would have already and if he was gonna hurt him he had had plenty of chances. He gestured to his head then signed. I, a, 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 I. Izuku slowly got up then climbed the fire escape and sat on the roof out of sight. He heard Eraserhead make the call and wait for police. Why am I waiting for him? What if he follows me? I am too out of it to know if he is following me. Why am I trusting him? No one I have ever trusted has ever told the truth. I am leaving. Hero Protocol says he has to stay with the villains until police arrive so I should have a two-minute head start. Staggering up he sneaked as quietly until he was two building away then he started sprinting. He was dizzy but he had been on these roofs so many times he didn't worry too much. He got off the roofs after a bit and started walking on the street. It would keep him hidden longer if Eraserhead couldn't see him. Did he feel bad for leaving Eraserhead? Yes and no. He felt bad because the hero had been nothing but nice to him but Izuku had lied to him. He didn't feel bad because how did he know the hero wasn't lying and what if he did turn Izuku in? He couldn't take that chance. He can't go back. No, he refused to go back. He would rather die than go back into the foster system or back to school. He had decided this a long time ago he thinks. Izuku got back to his home. He did have to take some pain meds and re-clean his wounds. Getting into his street clothes Izuku got into bed and settled in. He wasn't surprised to find the kid was gone. This was the closest he had gotten to the vigilante. He didn't expect Cherub to trust him immediately he would be worried if he did. I mean he is a stranger who could arrest him. He was worried about Cherub getting home with the concussion. Looking around he didn't see the kid. Eraserhead was surprised to find the kid hung on the wall with spiderweb. Once the villains were no longer a threat he did find it funny that it took the kid being stuck to be able to talk. It was surprising to learn the kid knew sign language but when it was explained that Cherub couldn't talk it made sense. Is he mute or does his quirk not allow him to? I will have to talk to Naomasa about this. I may not be turning him and doesn't mean I don't want to find out who he is so I can make sure he is safe. 
Eraser had tried to justify his thinking. Sighing he ran towards the police department. Chapter 13, Cats Get You Friends Summary, Izuku meets more of the Erizermic family and we get a bit of a domestic moment. Notes, Chapter Text, Concussions don't just disappear and they hurt, mostly when you live in an area where people find it fun to fight 24-7. Izuku both loved and hated the Red Light District. Sometimes it was fun to listen in on the fights because some of them were plain funny. Other times they weren't funny and there were ambulances and police sirens. He had found he just tuned it all out and had become numb to it. He hated that that's what had happened. Izuku was surviving off pain medication at this point but it was only taking the edge off his pounding headache. He needed to go somewhere quiet and less bothersome. Getting up he started walking out of the red light district. To the more expensive side of town or just the spot heroes actually patrolled so there wasn't much crime this took a long a while. He went to his the cafe he would charge his phone and use it. He hadn't been here in a long time. He didn't ever really use his phone so it wasn't like he missed it when it died a few weeks ago. He went to his favorite booth and plugged in his phone then laid his head down. The staff here seemed to be okay with him. They never kicked him out but they also didn't go out of their way to be nice. That was perfectly fine with Izuku he was only here to charge his phone and for the quiet atmosphere. Your cat is cute. He looked up seeing a teen about his age with purple fluffy hair that defied gravity. He was holding a multi-cup carrier that had three drinks in it. Izuku looked at what the kid was looking at. His phone had turned on again his lock screen was one of the stray cats that visited him a lot. Without thinking Izuku lifted his hands and signed. Hi. To his surprise the kid nodded in understanding. This is the second person he had met that new sign language in two days. What was going on? Hi my name is Atoshi. Do you ever feed her? H. I. And she is yours. Once you feed a cat they will never leave your side. That's what my dad always says. Can I sit? I want to show you my cat H. What is going on? Why is he being nice? This kid is weird. I. Thanks. Sorry if it was weird saying I liked your cat. I think she is really cute H. I. Izuku did actually like cats and he didn't hate talking to a kid his age. He didn't trust the kid but it was fun sharing pictures of cats. We have this one mean cat who only lets me and my dad pet him. My pops hasn't passed some imaginary test H. Itoshi laughs as he says this then shows a picture of a tuxedo cat loafing in an oddly familiar man's lap. It took a second but Izuku realized this was a racer head. I am talking to a racer head's son. What is my luck? Why are you making that face? H. Izuku tried to school his expression from the surprised face. I. He doesn't like my pops cause he is loud H. I. I just got a text from my dad. I have to go but this was nice. Can I get your number? H. That's fine thanks H. With that the kid left the cafe leaving Izuku more speechless than usual. He had just met a kid talked and then exchanged phone numbers. The only reason he had given his phone number was because he thinks a safe way to talk. It's a lot harder to hit someone through a phone. Also now he had blackmail on eraser head if he ever was gonna arrest Izuku. He was worried. Hitoshi had gone to their favorite cafe to pick up their coffee and a tea for Hizashi 30 minutes ago and still wasn't back. He texted Hitoshi asking where he was he got a text back saying he had gotten sidetracked. He decided to wait till his son got home to question him. Hitoshi entered the house and waved sheepishly at Aizawa. He walked over and gave him his coffee then took his own coffee from the carrier before putting the carrier on the kitchen table for Hizashi. There was this kid with a really cute cat lock screen, and I ended up talking to him about cats. Itoshi explained Aizawa smiled before saying, Only you would get distracted by a cat. No you would too. Fair enough. He sipped his coffee to find it was cold. If it takes you two minutes to get there and we pre-order, that means it took you around 24 minutes to talk to this kid. Hey cats are important. Itoshi retorted. You make a good point there. As Ashi walked into the room saw his tea then went over to get it. Hey Pops, at the no response Hitoshi stomped on the floor. Hizashi looked questioningly between Aizawa and Hitoshi to see who had gotten his attention. Do you have your hearing aids in? H. No, their battery needs to be replaced and I forgot to get new batteries P. Ah H. Hey, it's my day off from the station today so I should be all set. If you guys don't mind using sign language today P. At the same time both Hitoshi and Aizawa scrambled to say they didn't mind. I actually like using sign language. It's a fun way to communicate and then I can make sure I am warmed up and ready to go when I meet those who can't hear or speak H. Hey, why? You know it doesn't bother me P. Hey, huh. But I thought he talked to victims and comforted them. P. Maybe he is selectively mute like I was. Maybe he wasn't saying he couldn't talk physically but he couldn't talk mentally H. Aizawa nowadays forgot how far Hitoshi had come from that scared nine-year-old they had fostered. He had refused to talk for a while because he had been abused for his quirk. Hey, they sat around their living room sipping on their drinks in silence just enjoying each other. Then Hitoshi tapped the floor to get his both dad's attention. The kid who I shared cat photos with also spoke sign language. I was surprised at first. 
I have never been more handful to know it H. That's nice. What guy? P. Itoshi and Aizawa laughed at Hizashi's confusion. I explained. The kid had an adorable tortoise shell kitty. He said she was a stray. He said he fed her so I said what dad always says about feeding cats H. That is actually adorable. Our little Hitoshi is putting himself out there and talking to people. How old was he P? I think he was about my age but he was pretty small so I am not sure H. Did you get his number? Hizashi asked excitedly. Yes H, we should have him over. It's a kid your age and you both were talking about cats. This is destined to be a good friendship. P. Itoshi rolled his eyes but then agreed to see if he could come over at some point. They. His name is Izuku H. A. I didn't give him mine either Hitoshi shrugged. His ashy face palmed. How are we supposed to be responsible dads and look up potentiometer friends if we don't have a last name? He is joking right. Hitoshi turned to his dad. A. You too dad. H. A. Out of curiosity did you do one on me before you fostered me? H. A. Ha Hitoshi remarked. He was woken up very rudely to be kicked out. Apparently he was making people uncomfortable. How does a kid sleeping make them uncomfortable? He looked down at his phone before leaving to see a text from who he presumed was Hitoshi. He was sure it was Hitoshi 1 because no one else had his phone number and 2 because it was a picture of a cat. Izuku laughed and sent a funny picture of one of the stray cats he had seen a while ago. Izuku was bored and wasn't quite ready to go back yet so he walked around for a bit. To tell the truth he was pickpocketing people but hey they were in the rich area so it was fine. Or it was fine until he tripped while his hand was in someone's pocket. The guy realized what Izuku had been doing and started yelling at him. When Izuku went to run away he didn't expect the guy to start chasing him. He started running faster. He ended up running towards the red light district. He was trying to loose the guy in the alleys but he didn't know the alleys and this guy seemed to. The guy caught Izuku and tripped him. After a small fight that ended with Izuku on his butt with a bloody nose, the guy turned out to be a professional boxer. Who would've known? Izuku got up wiping his nose on his sleeve he walked out of the alley and was faced with maybe the best thing that would happen for a while. In front of him he saw a house for sale and realized something. He could stay in houses if they were vacant and then leave when they weren't. That day he grabbed everything he would need and moved it to a house that had a for sale sign. He made sure the house didn't have anyone in it. He moved in. Looking around him he had never been happier. He had a roof. He had a home. Even if it was only for a bit he now had a warm place to sleep where he had a bit of privacy. Was this maybe a dumb idea? Probably but that is a problem to deal with in the future. That night was a bit of a longer walk to get to his area but that was okay because he had a home. He was smiling the whole time under his mask as he took down villains. The villains were treated nicely that night. Chapter 14 Musical Notes These Battle Scars Musical Notes Summary I haven't had some angst in a sec so here you go. Izuku worries Aizawa more. Trigger warning. Gore. Mention of self-harm scars. Violence. Important note. A reader brought to my attention that you couldn't see Hitoshi's sign language responses. I went back and fixed that. The only chapter that needs rereading has chapter 13 and maybe 15. I also wanted to remind everyone that the only romantic couple in this fic is Eraserhead and Present Mike 12 223. Notes. Chapter text. Izuku was doing really well. He had switched homes twice now. He stayed in a house until the realtor came to put a sold sticker on the for sale sign. He did have a few close calls when there was a random house showing and he had to hide. Since he was in a home he didn't have to carry that much stuff. He had his saved food and water, his phone and charger in a plastic bag to keep dry, extra clothes, his money, his toiletries like shampoo, body wash and scissors, finally two blankets. This all fit mostly in one bag but the rest was in his vigilante duffel bag that he had gotten from the athletic store dumpster. Without the fear that he was going to be murdered or challenged every time he fell asleep he was able to sleep a lot better. He found he was a lot less stressed in general which helped. His only stress with his living was if a customer would come in. For that reason he stayed in the back rooms and always had a window open for quick escape. The house before this still had water and electricity so he was able to take a shower while there and able to charge his phone. He was learning that different house companies had different ways of keeping the house. Some would keep utilities on for the showings while the others didn't. While on patrols or if he wasn't there he would hide any evidence of him being there as best he could. Most times that meant hiding his things on the roof of the building or a nearby one. Another thing happening on patrols is he found he could text Hitoshi. It had been two weeks since their meeting. Izuku started regularly going to different cafes to charge his phone and talk to Hitoshi. He even found a building on his patrol that had free Wi-Fi. He would stop there and take breaks. Most of their convos were pictures of cats but recently they had just been talking more. Izuku found himself having to lie about stuff since he didn't quite have a normal life. He hated lying but this was his first friend in a long time and he wanted to stay friends so if that meant making up relatable stuff then that's what he would do. Hitoshi did ask why Izuku was awake at such late hours. He explained he had insomnia. This in fact was not a lie. 
Then when Hitoshi asked how he got the late night cat pictures Izuku said that he went for walks cause it helped him and would see stray cats. This also was not completely a lie. He had been doing a lot of half-truths. He liked Hitoshi. The one problem was he kept asking if he wanted to come over to meet his cats. Only thing he would have to do is have their parents meet. Now he would say yes but then remembered he was a homeless teen that stunk and didn't have a address or parents. He also was scared to go to a racer hen's house. What if he recognized him? He made up excuses not to go, saying he was busy and couldn't come over or that his parents wouldn't allow him. It was weird knowing he knew a racer head's son. It made him feel more confident so he did let the hero get closer. He also did have to admit that he did like the hero. When the homeless hero helped him from the spider web he didn't beat up Izuku or arrest him which he was very thankful for. He also let Izuku have his own space. The hero was nice Izuku knew that. But he knew that would change the second he learned Izuku was quirkless. If he knew that he would do the same thing everyone had done. He couldn't stand having another person turning on him or abandoning him. He couldn't get too close to a racer head or the hero would figure it out. Realizing this also helped him realize why he was also keeping Hitoshi at arm's length. Every few days he would let the homeless hero get a bit closer. He realized it would be a good thing to have the hero's help on patrol since Izuku did need saving sometimes. He also couldn't take down all the people he wanted. Some gangs were just too big to take on his own so he needed Eraserhead's connections and group fighting skills. Izuku still wasn't great at multiple targets at once. Eraserhead on the other hand seemed to be able to take down an infinite amount of people. If Izuku got the confidence to ask for help in person so he was part of it he would probably just be the backup that watched Eraserhead's back. The part that made Izuku laugh was the fact that Eraserhead only ever followed him every few nights. Most times it was because Izuku would go and get a bento box and homeless hero would see him. He knew the hero was trying to talk to him but he wasn't gonna let that happen. He hears a scream. Cherub takes off sprinting towards the screen. He looks over the edge of the building. He doesn't want to jump in without having a bit of an idea of how bad the situation. There was a teen being beaten up by a villain. He recognizes the kid. It's Deji. He could let Deji get beat up and get his karma or he could save him. He wanted to walk away. Every part of his body was saying go the other way but he knew he had to save him. He jumped in. He beat the guy pretty quickly. He tied him up. He was in a daze. He turned to Deji who was crying. He got on his knee in front of Deji. T thank you sir. You saved me. Cherub ignored this taking out his first aid stuff. He was not gentle. Deji was under him. Deji was thanking him. Deji was flinching with how hard Cherub is wiping the blood from his face. Cherub saved Deji. He called it in and waited till the police were close enough before leaving. Izuku was not present only Cherub. He didn't stop running he just kept running. When the tears filled his eyes he took out one half of his bow staff and chucked it. He went to grab it to find it was broken. He grabbed the other half and chucked it against the wall. He punched the brick. Rage clouded his mind. He knew not to patrol like this but he couldn't stop either. Grabbing the unbroken half of the bow staff and started hitting it off the wall. He heard steps behind him. Knife pulled he turned. Red glowing eyes greeted him. He lowered his knife but kept glaring. He was angry. A racer had needed to leave. What's wrong with you? Cherub didn't answer he was too mad to move his mouth or hands. He walked away from the hero. Picking up the broken bow staff he tossed it. As happy as I am that you didn't take your anger out on villains you probably shouldn't break your equipment. Cherub turned around to glare at the hero. He put the pieces of the bow staff in the dumpster. He started walking out of the alley. Seriously what is wrong? Cherub doesn't answer, he keeps walking. A racer head easily catches up. They walk down the street together. Bad day. I am going to take your lack of an answer and what I just saw is a yes. Cherub was too mad and angry to care. C. A. C. A. Cherub looked over his body. He was bleeding badly on his left bicep. The second he saw it anger surged before it just went away. He felt hollow. He could feel the pain in his bicep now and it hurt. I. A. Izuku thought about it he realized he wouldn't be able to stitch himself up with only one hand. I. Izuku scaled a building with a racer head not far behind him. Getting on the roof Izuku went to the middle and sat cross cross. He knew a racer head was being nice. He also knew that when he was in pain he fought back. He took out both of his knives and tossed them away. A. I. A. A racer head sat on the left side of Izuku. Izuku put his arm out for a racer head to look over. As a racer head turned his arm and tried to get a better look he said, I am gonna start talking so I can do this with my hands. So for me I need you to take your shirt off so I can see the cut fully. If you are not comfortable with that just take this arm out so I can see the full cut. I need you to hold a flashlight so I can see. Izuku was too tired to argue and also didn't have the use of his arm so he decided to just take off his shirts. It's not like a racer head could identify him off his abdomen. He also had a balaclava so his face would be completely hidden same with his hair. Izuku nodded then took off his shirts being careful not to let the clothes catch on the cut but also to make sure the balaclava didn't move. He held up his arm to a racer head. 
He was handed the flashlight he turned it on and held it up so the light was on the cut. Eraser had fixed his flashlight hand until he liked it. While Izuku had taken off his shirts Eraser had had gotten all the equipment needed to do stitches. Izuku was out of it. He didn't see the worried look Eraser had gave him. Eraser had had heard the scream. He also ran after it but he saw Cherub get there first. He hadn't even seen the kid before this. He saw Cherub stop for a bit then jump in. Eraserhead wanted to see why the kid had stopped longer than it would have taken him to asses the situation. He went up to see Cherub beat the shit out of this guy. The guy had some sort of reptile quirk. He had scales that created a bit of an armor and a tail that had spikes on it. The tail when the guy was going down caught on Cherub's arm. Cherub didn't even flinch he just kept going. He beat the guy more than he needed to. He roughly took care of the victim then waited for the police to get close enough. Cherub didn't talk the whole time the victim tried to talk to him. Cherub got onto the roofs and took off. Is he running cause he saw me? He seems pretty out of it. I am gonna go make sure he doesn't murder someone. He follows behind Cherub he sees the kid chuck his bow staff. He saw all of the kid's tantrum. Something was wrong and he didn't know what it was. He hadn't seen the kid before the last fight so he had no idea if this was because of the incident or if he was like this. He was worried seeing the kid chuck things and break things. It was a little scary. He had seen this kid act like big things were small but now he was beating the hell out of a staff. When Cherub ran at him with the knife all Eraserhead could do was activate his quirk he had gotten ready to fight but he wasn't gonna hit the kid he was in a defensive position. The kid's reaction to being told he was injured was also worrisome. He knew it was adrenaline and the kid was probably too angry to notice what was weird was the kid seemed to literally deflate when he realized. He went to start doing the stitches when he saw just how many scars Cherub had. He had scars up and down his arm of different times. Some were little starburst one looked like electrical, other looked like knife or slice marks. What really worried Eraserhead was the self-harm scars on the kid's wrist. He was a kid. A kid. A fucking kid. He was a kid in hand-fucking self-harm marks, slash marks, starburst burn and handprint scars all over his arms and torso. He hated that this was this kid's reality. He was happy that there didn't seem to be any new ones they all seemed to be old not to fresh. He tried not to show he how surprised and angry he was. He tried to just focus on sticking the kid up. As he got to a particular deep spot the kid sucked in air. I'm sorry. The kid huffed. The kid was being stitched up and he was laughing. The more he thought about it the madder he got. He needed to help this kid. Things were making more sense and he felt so bad. He finished sticking the kid up. He went over the wound with a disinfectant wipe for the billionth time then wrapped it in a bandage. You are all set. Try not to exert yourself too much. Make sure not to rip the stitches. I will see you at the cooler in a few days so I can take them out and check how it's healing. Cherub nodded then put his clothes on. The kid looked so tired. I know you won't let me walk you home so I am gonna stand here and let you go before I continue my patrol. I want you to go home. I. The kid started off. Eraserhead took out his phone. He texted his ashy asking if he could have hot chocolate ready and that he would be home in 30 minutes. Looking at the sky it was getting pretty light out. It was 4 in the morning. He started walking home. What's up? You don't ask for hot cocoa unless something is wrong. His ashy asked worriedly. It's green cherub. We both responded to a scream. The kid got there first and went in first. He took down the villain but not without getting hurt first. He wasn't mentally there. He was so robotic. He took care of the victim who was a kid. He even waited for the police before running off. He had an angry episode. I asked him what was wrong and he reacted violently. We figured it out and he realized he was injured on his arm. There was a giant cut on his bicep that he hadn't noticed until I told him. I had to stitch it up which isn't a problem. The problem is when he had to take off his shirt so I could see the full cut I saw the amount of scars this kid had. He had burned scars, slashes and other marks all over him. Show I am so sorry. Is there any chance those scars are from being a vigilante? Most of the scars were older but some were new. Hizashi he had self-harm scars. Hizashi covered his mouth in shock. Then hugged Aizawa. I need to get him off the street, Aizawa said. Chapter 15 Attention to Detail Summary Izuku is free. More Rizermic family time. Important notice. Someone brought up the fact that Hitoshi's sign language was missing. I am really sorry the symbol I used didn't work. Other than this chapter 13 is the only chapter I had to fix. I would really appreciate it if you went back and read it so it makes more sense. 12 2 23 I also wanted to remind you that the only romantic couple that is in the fic is Eraserhead and Present Mike. Notes Chapter Text Izuku met up with Hitoshi in the cafe they had met and they were talking sign language while they sipped their coffees. Izuku had showered and cut his hair. He had also gotten better clothes so it wasn't obvious that he was homeless. I don't want to be rude and I am really sorry if this is but how did you get the scars on your face H? Izuku had a scar from mid-cheek to his jawline. Another cut his eyebrow that went from just under his eyebrow across his forehead where it landed in his hairline. He had an explosion burn scar on his jawline. 
He had other random scratches and scrapes that weren't as bad as the other three but they could be noticeable. Izuku forgets that he has scars and it's not seen as normal. Iz was an a clumsy kid. The burn was when I got to slope to the oven while my mom was cooking. The other ones were in a car crash. My window shatters, Izuku explained. He hoped it was enough for Hitoshi not to question it. Aye. Hitoshi looked nervous. Izuku regretted asking but then with a deep breath Hitoshi answered. It's from a muzzle I had to wear before my dad's adopted me. My old foster family thought my quirk was villainous. H. I. Hitoshi looked surprised at Izuku's response. Thank you H. They fell into a comfortable silence. It was interrupted when a racer head and a blonde walked in. They saw the two teens then went over to their table after ordering their drinks. The blonde talked first. Is this the kid you were talking about? Did you guys really come to spy on my hangout? And yes this is Izuku. Izuku these are my overprotective dads. Hitoshi explained. Yes Hitoshi we did. Hello I am Hizashi Yamada. And I am Shota Aizawa. They both shook his hand which kinda was weird but oh well. He was frozen because here was Eras Aizawa who knew him as Cherub. Yamada seemed familiar but he couldn't place it then it made sense. I, yup. It's crazy isn't it? H. Izuku was completely in shock. The next thing surprised him even more. Present Mike joined the conversation in sign language. Hey little listener. I was wondering something. Hitoshi didn't mention a last name. What is your full name? P. Izuku didn't know what to say. If he said his last name then they could look him up. Izuku didn't know what was on his record but he knew he didn't want them finding out so he made up a lie that made sense in his head. I, in case you don't know what emancipation is it's the act of being seen as an adult before you are 18. In America you have to prove you have stable living and a job. Your parents have no control of you. You do have to prove that this is the best situation for yourself. For America you have to be 16 but in Europe you have to be 14. Well that solves the mystery of why you don't talk about your parents' age. If you are 13 how did you get emancipated? Aizawa asked skeptical. Izuku decided this was the best way to break the news. Aye. If he had looked up from his hands in his lap he would have seen the look the family shared. He was surprised when he saw movement come from present Mike. Well I hope this is better for you. If you ever need anything our door is open for you. Izuku looked up in shock. Tears almost started blurring his vision. Why would they do this? They must be lying. He looked between the family to see they seemed to be serious. Before Izuku could stop himself he ran out of the cafe. He heard them yell after him but he couldn't go back. They were lying they had to be. They were playing a prank on him. He didn't think present Mike could be mean. He had been thinking about it for a few days. That conversation about emancipation did give him an idea. There was a pretty big chance that something like that would happen. He looked at the money he was saving. He had been saving it for a very small apartment. Izuku was tired of living on the streets and he made money so he could rent a very small apartment. Izuku decided he would turn himself and then try to get emancipated. He didn't want to lie to Hitoshi and his family. Hitoshi had texted him multiple times but Izuku didn't know how to answer so he didn't. When Izuku was taken to the group home he had kept the envelope with everything in it. He kept the envelope in a plastic bag with his money. He still had his old social worker's card so he went to an internet cafe then called him. This is Kenzo Watanabe. Who am I speaking with? He almost went to go sign but then realized he would have to talk. I I don't know if you remember me but this is Izuku Midori. I know you dropped my case. I just want to know if I would need a social worker to gather emancipated. His voice was gravely and gross. Damn we thought you were dead. Ooh. Yes you would need a social worker. If this is just to get emancipated and then I wouldn't have to deal with you I am willing to take your case. I, I just want to get emancipated then I won't contact you again. Okay meet me at blah 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 street. You have an appointment with me in three hours. I can get this rushed through so wear something nice and look nice. Mr. Watanabe said blandly. Oh okay. Do I need to bring anything? No I have copies of all your paperwork. The phone clicked. Izuku couldn't believe it. He ran from there. He took a shower then snuck into a dry cleaning business through the back window. He took some nice clothes. A nice button up that should fit and some nice pants. He took the envelope of paperwork just in case. He headed over to Mr. Watanabe's office early. He checked in with the secretary. After 15 minutes he was directed to Mr. Watanabe's desk. Damn kid you look different. I like the short hair. Anyway so since you are quirkless the court won't care too much and you should just get past almost immediately. You will have the chance to change your name. I will warn you that this will take more paperwork. I am required to do a follow-up to make sure you are living somewhere nice and have a job but I honestly don't care. Here are some apartment building that don't ask questions and accept all quirks or lack thereof. And here are some jobs that you could get. He handed the two pamphlets to Izuku. Izuku stared down at the papers then in a rough voice. Thank you so much. No problem. As much as I don't care I am sorry for what happened. Izuku nodded awkwardly. Okay so we are going down the street to the courthouse. It was hard to get you in so quickly but the faster the system can wash their hands of you the better. Mr. Watanabe started walking away. 
Izuku had to jump up to follow. They got to the courthouse they checked and then were sent to a conference room. A official looking man walked in. Everyone bowed to each other then sat down. So, you Izuku Midori are looking to get emancipated, official guy says. Yes, Izuku wrung his hands in his lap. Well you look to be all set. You have all the paperwork needed. You have seemingly been living on your own for almost two years now so I feel confident signing off on this. Izuku didn't realize how easy it would actually be. He was disappointed that the system was this messed up but he was happy it helped him. The man signed off on a document then made a copy of it. He gave the copy to Mr. Watanabes and gave the official document to Izuku. We will want paperwork on the name change and we need proof of employment and an address by the end of the week. Until then you are known as Izuku Midoriya. You will receive minimum health care and other cares. Have a nice day. Before the man left he gave Izuku a stack of papers. They walked out of the building. Mr. Watanabe turned to Izuku. I will need the paperwork in a few days so I can give it to the court. Just give it to me at my office. Mr. Watanabe walked away. Izuku was free. This also made it so he wasn't lying anymore. He needed to text Hitoshi back he deserved an apology. He went to the nearest internet cafe. After a bunch of texts back and forth Izuku found out Hitoshi wasn't mad he was worried. He also learned he was invited over to Hitoshi home. Izuku thanked him but said he had work. They talked for a bit longer but then Hitoshi had dinner. Izuku decided to look at the pamphlets Mr. Watanabe had given him. He was both surprised and not surprised to see the cozy corner cafe on there but if he was doing that he would have to talk so instead he went for a job that didn't require talking. He got an interview at one of the mail companies. His job would be putting envelopes and packages in the right place. He also was in charge of putting them on the trucks to be shipped. He also handled the incoming mail and put those into PO boxes. He got the job which surprised him. Once he had proof of employment he went and toured the different housing buildings in the pamphlets. He found one. A cheap small apartment. It had one bedroom a small kitchenette and a very small bathroom. The kitchen was a mini fridge, counter and a sink. There was plenty of storage and outlets. He would have to get a hot plate to cook on. The bathroom was a sink toilet and very small stall shower. Izuku didn't care this was luxury compared to the alley. With the money he had been saving and taking from villains he was able to pay the security deposit. He had proof of housing. This all took him a few days. There was a few things left to do. He decided to go to the cozy corner so he could look stuff up that he didn't know. He was sitting there trying to figure out what he was writing down on some of the paperwork when someone sat down across from him. He looked up and it was present Mike out of costume. He didn't know if he would ever be able to call him Yamada Hazashi. Do you need help with that? I am here picking up Hitoshi Aizawa's and my drinks. It's not a bother. I would also like to apologize for the other day. P. Uh, he didn't mean to answer so shortly but he honestly didn't know what else to say. Okay, I want you to know by the way that I was completely serious about what I said. If you need anything you are welcome come over or ask. You are a good friend to Hitoshi and it isn't fair that you don't have someone watching over you. P. He said this then got up waving goodbye. Izuku waved back he was really confused. The hardest thing for Izuku was coming up with a last name. He was Izuku and he liked that but he didn't want to be tied to old Midoriya. He didn't want the reminder that he had been disowned. He couldn't decide so he put a bunch of random surnames in a spin-a-wheel thingy and spun it until there was only one left. His new name was Izuku Sasaki. He had finished the, all the paperwork he needed so he dropped it off at Mr. Watanabe's office. The next day he would have his first day of work and he would be able to move into his apartment. He was excited to start working because he didn't have any money left. He hadn't been patrolling because how busy he has been and because he has been having to stay awake during day hours. He would have to change his sleep schedule since he had a job now. It was six days a week 9 to 5. He had Sundays off and had a 30-minute lunch break. Today was training then he was on his own. To say he was excited was an understatement. He would be getting a steady paycheck a steady home and he didn't have to hide anymore. Only problem was his job was in the rich area while his apartment was in the middle of the red light district so it was quite the trek. It did give him a good chance to keep up his stamina so that's what he turned it into. A few days and he decided he liked his job. It didn't change too much and his boss was nice also it was pretty easy. He had moved in. He didn't have a bed or any furniture yet but that was fine. He had a space of his own and that's what mattered. Also he didn't have to hide his money anymore because now he had a bank for his paychecks that he would get weekly. He decided to settle in before going back to being a vigilante. When Izuku ran he was worried. He was also a little mad at his dad's. If they had let them be then Izuku wouldn't have run away. He would be texting back right now. If his fathers had mind their business then his first real friend would be here. His dads knew he was annoyed with him and gave him space for a bit before they called a family meeting. After talking they made up. As if on cue he got a text from Izuku. With his pop's help he talked it out with Izuku. 
Itoshi knew he wasn't great with words but his dad was so his dad helped him respond and how to lead the conversation so it was resolved. He was sad to know that Izuku still couldn't come over because he had work. His dad explained how hard being emancipation can be. He had been emancipated when he was a kid. A while later Pops came home with their cozy corner orders. He looked shocked and was smiling. You will never guess who I saw. With Pops' smile and his eyebrow raises at Itoshi he knew who. You saw Izuku. Itoshi asked skeptically. Yup. He was at the cozy corner. He was doing a lot of paperwork so I only talked to him for a little bit. I mostly apologized and also said he was free to come over whenever. He is allowed over whenever. Itoshi knew he was allowed over but usually the first time someone came over it was for lunch only. Yes me and your pops talked about it and decided he was safe enough to come over. We do need a few hour heads up though. Dad walked out from the hallway. He went over to pops gave him a peck then applied his eye drops. Hey pops, did Izuku look okay? I know he said he was but I haven't seen him. Oh Toshi, he is okay. He looked tired but that was it. His dad said in a sympathetic voice. A few days later he got a text from Izuku saying he would be getting internet soon so he would be able to text more. This made Hitoshi happy but what made him happier was Izuku sent Hitoshi his work schedule so they could come up with a time to hang out. Hitoshi asked his dads and then reported to Izuku that they could do Sunday dinner. Why do you think Izuku doesn't talk? We know he is quirkless so it's not like it's a mutation. He asked his pops that night at dinner. He might have similar reasons to you. Maybe he was bullied out of talking. His pops said solemnly. You know the scars on his face. He said that the burn was from when he was a kid. He had gotten too close to the stove. And then he said the two big scratches were from a car accident. I am not sure how true that is since he is so skittish and I know the statistics for quirkless people. Hitoshi said. Only he knows the real stroke so I think it would be better not to speculate. I understand your worry but if Izuku wanted you to know you would know. He might not be ready yet. His dad answered. I hope he is okay. He said. We all do, his pop said. Chapter 16, He Actually Cares Summary, Izuku is doing great. Important note, a reader brought to my attention that Hitoshi's sign language responses weren't showing up. I fixed that. The only chapters you might want to reread are 13 and 15. I am so sorry for this I didn't realize it was happening. I also wanted to remind everyone that the only romantic couple in this fic is Eraserhead and Present Mike. 12 to 23. Notes, Chapter Text Izuku only agreed to dinner cause he felt bad blowing Hitoshi off a billion times. He was really scared. Hitoshi asked if they could meet at Cozy Corner since he didn't feel safe putting their address down. Izuku completely understood. Izuku now had internet in his apartment. With his first paycheck he bought a futon. It was weird sleeping in an actual bed. He already had plans for his next paycheck. Izuku walked to the Cozy Corner Cafe. He had taken a shower and was wearing his best clothes. He got to there and sat down at his usual booth to wait for Hitoshi and his dad so arrived. He loved the fact that the flamboyant loud blonde married a grumpy quiet tired cat vibes guy. He saw them enter. They made contact. Walking over everyone sat down. Hitoshi next to Izuku and his dad's across the table. So before you come over we do have a few questions. This isn't a test or anything. 1. Are you allergic to cats? 2. Would you prefer if we all spoke in sign language? We are all fluent. 3. Are we calling you Izuku or something else? Hizashi asked all of these. I he hesitated to answer before realizing he was being dumb by not answering. Okay. These next questions are because 1. We are heroes and Hitoshi is in danger because of that but also because we want to make sure we know things about you before you enter our home. Again this isn't a test and I am sorry that we have to do this. It isn't anything you have or haven't done we would do this to anyone. Eraserhead answered. He had to be careful to call him Aizawa otherwise they would figure him out. Izuku nodded. Eraserhead handed him a notepad and a pencil. I need you to write down your name, phone number, address, workplace and if you have a guardian or social worker attached to you case I need their name and phone number, Aizawa said. Izuku nodded and wrote everything down. He didn't write down Mr. Watanabe since he didn't want to be a part of Izuku's life if he could help it. Once finished he handed the paper back to Aizawa. By the way no one except me and Hizashi will see this. You can call me Aizawa by the way. You can haul me Hizashi. I think last names are to formal, Hizashi said teasingly. Aizawa rolled his eyes. Well we are all said to head to the house. I ask that you please don't tell anyone where we live or write it down. Also people don't know me and Hizashi are married or even a couple. Aizawa said as he got up and started walking out. They all got up. Izuku kinda hung in the back of the group. Oh yeah, there is only one test today. The test is to see if Bastard approves of you or not, Hitoshi said excitedly. Izuku wasn't too nervous but he hoped Hitoshi would still like him if Bastard didn't. They got to Hitoshi home. Izuku was nervous. Aizawa and Hizashi entered first removing their shoes and getting into house shoes. Hitoshi went in next and showed Izuku the guest house shoes before putting his own on. Izuku followed their lead. 
You guys can do whatever I have to finish dinner and your dad has to go do paperwork. Okay, I am gonna introduce you to Bastard and Ramen. Itoshi says as he grabs a bag of treats and shakes them while walking into the living room. Izuku followed. Izuku wondered where the names came from but he guessed there was a reason. Two cats came into the living room one tan colored one immediately rubbed on Izuku while the other one the tuxedo stopped when he saw the visitor. The cat seemed to analyze Izuku before deciding he wasn't a threat. With his tail high in the air he strutted over to Hitoshi. Hitoshi smiled and gave each cat a treat. He doesn't hate you which is better than my pops. Hitoshi laughed. Hitoshi handed Izuku two treats. Izuku crouched down giving the tan cat her treat. When he went to give Bastard his treat the cat slowly took the treat before running off. Ramen on the other hand kept rubbing against Izuku and meowing. I. H. Izuku picked up the cat. She started purring immediately. Izuku stroked her soft fur. A small smile made an appearance on his face. He hadn't smiled in a while. Dinner is ready. Can you guys go get dad from his study? Hazashi said. Itoshi and Izuku headed down the hallway. As they got closer he could hear Aizawa talking on the phone. I understand he might be taking a break but he has been gone for a few weeks now. He never checked in and got the stitches removed. I think something is row. I know not worth it to jump to conclusions but he was interrupted by Hitoshi knocking on the door. Hey dad dinner's ready. Okay I will be out in a second I have to finish this call. Neamasa I know I can't help him unless I know who he actually is. They walked out of your shot. Dad is on a phone call about his vigilante and won't be out for a second. Izuku decided to ask though he was pretty sure he knew what the answer would be. I, oh my dad is an underground hero in the red light district. There is this vigilante that he was put on the case of. Apparently he is a kid. Dad's life was saved by him a few months ago. But the vigilante hasn't been around for a few weeks and dad's worried because the last time he saw him he was all cut up. The vigilante's name is Green Cherub. I think he is really cool. I, no dad just wants him to be safe. He is hoping he can convince him to stop being a vigilante. I, they sat down and dished out the portions to cool on each plate. They waited a bit for Aizawa but he came out. He was annoyed. Izuku struck in on himself on instinct. They all sat down and started eating. The second he tasted the food he knew Aizawa wasn't the one cooking the bentos. Aizawa had taken credit for Hizashi's work. So do you like emancipation? Hizashi asked. I, what school do you go to? I, really? I would have thought they make you get an education. Itoshi said. It matters your situation. Because I was living with Hizashi I didn't have to work when I got emancipated so I was able to get an education, Aizawa answered. After some more small talk dinner was over, Hitoshi decided to give Izuku a tour of the house. All the bedrooms and closets were on the second floor of the house. The guest bathroom, two offices and guest bedroom were on the first floor. The basement was a home gym with all different kinds of workout equipment. Izuku loved Hitoshi's room. It had its own cat tree where Bastard was sleeping. Itoshi had a lot of squishmallows and other comfy things. When they got back to the living room Hizashi asked, Hey Izuku how are you getting home? I, alone, at 8 o'clock at night. No you don't. Aizawa can walk you home on his way to patrol. You live in the red light district right? I, well lucky because he is headed there in 15 minutes. You my dads will never let you walk home alone after dark. They know how dangerous it is, Hitoshi said. They sat on the couch watching funny cat videos until Aizawa walked into the room in full costume. For some reason this made Izuku nervous. Okay, ready to head out Izuku? Aizawa asked. Izuku was very nervous and he is pretty sure this will be awkward. He wasn't fully wrong. They walked in silence. It was familiar. When he got to his apartment complex Aizawa waved to him then left. Izuku turned and walked up to his apartment. He thought back on the night. Aizawa Aka Eraserhead was genuinely worried about him. He really wasn't planning to arrest him. He decided he would start patrolling again. He got his gear on he realized his shirt still had a hole in it. Before he left he sewed it up. He climbed out his window jumping onto the fire escape ladder. He left his window barely cracked so he could get back in. Climbing to the roof he started his patrol. This time he had kept up his training so he wasn't very rusty. He went to the cooler pee. He wanted to wait for a racer head to show he was okay but he realized how weird that would be. He chickened out and started actually patrolling. He still didn't quite trust a racer head but after meeting his family and hearing about him he trusted him more. At least now he had a good amount of blackmail. It took a few days for a racer head and Izuku to naturally bump into each other. They waved at each other then moved on. Izuku had let a racer head get on the same building before running away. One time when they passed each other a racer head tossed something at Izuku. He looked down to see it was a granola bar. This started happening regularly. Almost every time they saw each other a racer head would throw him a sneak. It was always changing what the snack was. Izuku actually really liked it. He didn't always eat it right then and he would save it for work later. He would still eat the bentos every now and then and he continued the notes of big groups. Izuku had never been so happy he was working living and patrolling on his own. 
He had an amazing friend and someone who worried about him. Izuku didn't want to get attached but every Sunday dinner it got harder and harder not to. It was weird having people who cared about him. He didn't think he would very get used to it. Chapter 17 It's nice to be cared about. Summary Some training then some domestic shit for you. Important notice A reader pointed out that Hitoshi's sign language responses were not showing up. I went back and fixed that. Only chapters that need to be reread are 13 and 15. Also a reminder that there are no romantic couples other than Aizawa and Hizashi. Notes Chapter Text After Eraserhead had to save Izuku from another group attack Eraserhead came up to Cherub and goes. That's it. I am going to train you how to fight multiple enemies. Meet at the cooler tomorrow at 8. I don't patrol till 9 and I don't know what time you patrol but you can hold it for a bit for this. Aizawa said this leaving no room for protest or argument. The next night Izuku showed up early. The second he got there Eraserhead started going over the strategy to almost win always. One on multiple fights are dangerous for the one. There really is no way of solving that. The trick is knowing that and doing everything you can to keep yourself safe. That day was just the logistics of it and hearing an actual plan. I know it's hard watching someone get hurt but you need to wait to one enter the fight at the best moment and two so you can see who the biggest threats are. You don't seem to have quirk that reaches or any enhanced senses so your biggest weaknesses are long-range quirks and barriers or armors. Like I said I know it's hard to know someone is getting hurt while you assess the situation but it's better to be confident you can stop the fight and win so the victim doesn't get hurt more than if you were to rush in and lose because you did look to see who the strongest member was and now both you and the victim are hurt. Aizawa said roughly but Izuku knew Aizawa was telling the full truth. Tomorrow we will be doing some sparring. You can opt out of this but no I am not going to go hard on you and I am not going to arrest you. I know I can't stop you from patrolling so I would like to know I can trust you can handle yourself. Fair enough. Eraserhead and Izuku then started their patrols. The next night was the sparring. Izuku was nervous. He was nervous because he would be fighting a pro hero. And if he lost Eraserhead at any time could go against his word and unveil him. When Eraserhead got there he took off his goggles and scarf. No support weapons. You are going to learn how to hand-to-hand -to -hand fight before you add weapons. I don't want you to take this as me saying you are not good at fighting. You are good at fighting but you are not nearly good enough as you need to be. If you want to stop sparring let me know. From then on for a week's Eraserhead would teach Izuku how to fight better. He kept adding more and more opponents on by having Izuku jump into brawls that Eraserhead had dubbed okay. When it came to Izuku and Aizawa's relationship Izuku had a hard time not being too familiar with him. He had started joining Hitoshi's family for dinner every Sunday. Izuku was amazed with the personality differences between Aizawa and Eraserhead. This is what really got Izuku to make one set of moral and personality rules for Izuku and a different set of rules for Chera. He didn't want Aizawa seeing the similarities and connecting them. The time Izuku struggled with the most was when Aizawa would walk him home while he was in costume. Izuku thought of Eraserhead and Aizawa as two different people and seeing him as both made it really hard to make sure the rules were followed. Izuku wasn't really supposed to know Aizawa's hero name so he had to be careful not to call him that. Cherub and Eraserhead had become a lot closer. Cherub still refused to talk and he wasn't going to anytime soon. The only time Cherub let Eraserhead get in arm's reach was when training otherwise Cherub kept some distance. In the past week or two Eraserhead had been teaching Cherub proper bow staff techniques. After the bow staff Eraserhead would teach Cherub the art of knives but he wasn't there yet. It had been almost three months of training with Eraserhead. Izuku had gained some speed and muscle since Eraserhead had given him an outside of training workout routine. Izuku found to hide the evidence of his training with Eraserhead from Aizawa he was having to wear baggier clothes. Izuku already only wore long sleeve shirts and pants to hide his scars from both Hitoshi and his family but also from everyone else. He hated his scars. He hated the looks he got for them so he hid them. He was sad that he couldn't hide his face scars but he had an excuse ready if anyone asked. Something that was funny to find out from when he was over at their house was the fact that Aizawa talked about Cherub a lot. Hitoshi actually really wanted to meet Cherub because he looked up to him. This shocked Izuku. Why would anyone look up to him? It was funny to hear Aizawa's opinion of him. What almost made him choke one time was when Hizashi asked, Hey Izuku you live in the red light district have you met him? Aye, that is a lie. You send me pictures of stray cats you see all the time at night. It has actually make me wonder when you sleep since you are always at work. Hitoshi unhelpfully retorted. He said the last part looking at Hitoshi. Izuku smiled at he memory under his mask. He shouldn't have gotten distracted though because this almost let Eraserhead get a hard hit on him. I don't know what's been distracting you but you need to get your head in the game. Eraserhead scolded. Izuku sign then got back in starting position. One night Eraserhead asked if Izuku was comfortable starting really early and going on a field trip. We have literally been doing this for three months and you still don't believe I am not gonna arrest you. Cherub shrugged for a response. Well I want you to go up against more opponents but that would be dangerous if they were real so I was thinking. 
I am a teacher at UA The Hero School. I always have access to the campus so I was holding we could go there and use the multi-enemy simulator. It would be a 30-minute jog there. If I get Nezu's permission, I t know what the price of this will be. Also I wanted to tell you I am a teacher so that you knew why I am going to have to stop training you soon because the term is starting and I will be busy. How old are you? Yeah I guess that. I ask because I want to see if you are old enough or too old to go to UA. I think you should join the hero program. Cherub answered the biggest five reason he wouldn't be allowed in though was the fact he was quirkless but Eraserhead didn't need to know that. Damn, you would have done amazingly. Cherub answered. Izuka's job was near there so he could leave there get changed then train. Okay what about Thursday this week at 5.30? A bit later Cherub turns to Eraserhead as they are taking a break from patrolling. Trust me kid, you do not want to know. The Eraserhead answered. Izuku was proud of himself as he looked around his apartment. He had a double burner hot stove. His fridge had good food in it. He had everything he needed. He had gotten curtains and some furniture for his apartment. He had a coffee table and two bin bag chairs. His futon also doubled as the couch. His bathroom was stocked with anything he needed. He also got a bunch of different lights. He hated the gross yellow light the apartment had so he put of string lights and LEDs. He was able to buy data and Wi-Fi so he now always had service. He had money for the laundry mat. And he even bought his own phone. His old phone is now Cherub's phone. He still took money from villains making it easier to pay for all of this. He had bought a bunch of cleaning stuff and was currently scrubbing the apartment top to bottom. Hitoshi was going to come over but his dads had to come over to to make sure it was safe. Izuku made his apartment spotless and even bought a candle to light to make sure it smelled nice. He didn't spend much time in his apartment other to eat and sleep so the mess didn't bother him. Also being homeless makes you tolerant to a lot of things. He in no way was slob but he also wasn't that clean either. He actually put his clothes folded or hung up away in the closet and dresser that came with the apartment. He decided to hide his gear somewhere else that night so there was no chance of it being found. It was currently sitting in on the roof. Izuku was nervous because he was making dinner for them. He didn't have a dining table since he lived alone only the coffee table. He also only had two of everything dishware since again it was only him. He ended up having to go buy groceries and some dishware. He decided to make his favorite meal. Katsudan he would steam vegetables in case they wanted to add them on or just eat the katsudan. He was going to make Inko's recipe but change it slightly to make it his own. He was a pretty good cook. Since he was tall enough to safely use the oven he had been cooking. He learned how to cook quickly since Inko wasn't there he had to make his own healthy meals. He also had done a lot of research. He was almost done cooking when they arrived. He had to go downstairs to let them in and lead the way to the apartment which was awkward. The family was looking around at everything judging it. Izuku didn't live in a good building but it wasn't bad. Almost everyone was pretty quiet but the actual quality of the building wasn't great. There was almost never actually hot water on warmish water. The power went out every now and then for no apparent reason. There was more and it was all being judged currently. Izuku welcomed them in. Only then did he realize how small his little apartment was. It was big for just him but it was tiny with all four of them in it. Izuku signed. It's perfect little listener. It makes sense not to have a big table since it's just you. Also it smells really good. As Ashi said as he went over and sat on the futon. Izuku had moved his bedding off it and hid it in the storage around the room. He had set the futon against the wall then put the table in front of it. The beanbags sat next to each other on the other side of the small table. Izuku felt embarrassed. Anything we can help with? As Ashi asked. Izuku was going to shake his head then realized he did. I, I will do it. Hitoshi volunteered. He showed Hitoshi where everything he needed was and then they started cooking. Izuku made the bowls of katsu and then took them over to the table. He grabbed utensils for everyone. Then putting a mitt down he placed the vegetables in the middle of the table. Aye. Everyone asked for tea so he grabbed it and served it out. Aizawa and Hizashi were sitting on the futon while Hitoshi and Izuku were in the bean bags. He watched as everyone took a bite. If anyone didn't like it they didn't show it. This is delicious Izuku. Hizashi said. I don't usually like katsudan. Aizawa said. He saw Hizashi kick Aizawa. Ignore dad this is really good. And that is a compliment from him. Pops you should get Izuka's recipe. Aye. The family had learned a bit about Izuka's past over the last three months of Sunday dinner. Izuku really liked the family they were nice to him and actually cared. Hitoshi had started teaching Izuku what he was learning in school. Which was pretty funny because Hitoshi had no idea how to teach it so Hizashi was dragged into helping but then Hizashi would get confused because it wasn't what he learned which then would bring Aizawa into it. That's when it got hilarious because Aizawa was confused and would get frustrated because he didn't know it. It usually ended with Aizawa yelling at the paper with his quirk activated staring at the paper, Hitoshi and Hizashi laughing until they were in tears and Izuku smiling. He felt safe with the family. No one was purposely mean and everyone was themselves. Hizashi and Aizawa were very understanding parents they always did their best to protect and understand Hitoshi. 
Izuku was happy to be a part of it even if he was more of just a witness to it. He liked it and was okay enjoying while it lasted because when it came to Izuku he knew good things never lasted for him. It did make him sad that he missed out on a family like this but he knew he didn't deserve it. Izuku had bought some board games to play since he didn't have a TV. At the Yamada Aizawa house set is were movie nights or family game night depending on what they were in the mood for. Since it was sad he knew he had to get card games. They had chosen to do this dinner on a set because it worked better and they still wanted to have Sunday dinner at the Yamada Aizawa home. Izuku brought out the games he had bought. He bought old games from before Quirks. Hazashi kept the house pretty well stocked with different games but he didn't have all the old games. Izuku had bought games he knew they didn't have. Uno, sorry, and a cheap poker set. He was not ready for the chaos this would cause. Rules laid out. The cards were shuffled and handed out. Hitoshi had picked Uno. He would regret this. Since Izuku had shuffled Hitoshi went first. Izuku cut the deck Hitoshi flipped the bottom card. It was a yellow too. Hizashi started to sweat. Hitoshi put down his only yellow card. Aizawa looked at the deck then looked at his cards. He smiled, then put down a same number red effectively changing the color. Hizashi slumped in his chair he had no red. Only green. His whole hand. His whole hand was green. No numbers matched so he ended up having to draw. After two cards he pulled a same number green. Hazashi placed the card, cheering as he did so. Izuku smiles then did something evil. He placed a wild plus four card down. Izuku came to play. Hazashi remarked as Hitoshi gave Izuku I am gonna get you look. Izuku could do nothing but smile accepting the challenge. I. Hitoshi picked up four then put down one of his only blue cards. Aizawa put down a blue reverse. Betrayal. Hitoshi accused. Hey I am just playing the game. Hitoshi had to pick up three cards before getting a blue. Izuku placed a blue reverse. Asshole. Hitoshi grumbled under his breath. Hitoshi picked up four cards before getting a same number yellow. He placed it. Aizawa placed a yellow down. Hizashi placed down a skip card. Hitoshi looked at his pops with betrayal. I can expect this from these two but not from you pops. Hitoshi says while gesturing to Izuku and Aizawa. That was my only yellow sorry kiddo. That was my only yellow too. Hitoshi responded. Izuku was grinning from his seat as Hitoshi drew seven cards before placing a same number blue. Let's do a quick ad break in card count. They all started with five they now have. Izuku has four cards. Aizawa has three cards. Hizashi has six cards. Hitoshi has 21 cards. The game ended with Izuku winning they chalked it up to him only winning because he knew the game. To that Izuku challenged them to another round. Every time someone would challenge to another round. Pops how do they keep winning? Hitoshi asked from his position on the floor. I don't know kid but think they are cheating. How dare you accuse me and Izuku of cheating? Aizawa said. Dad you and Izuku have taken turns winning the last 7 rounds. Me and Pops haven't won the game once. Izuku signed this then shrugged. The family all shared looks this was the first times Izuku had come out of his shell enough to insult one of them. Hitoshi and Hizashi made eye contact then nodded. They now were on a mission to either make Izuku laugh or get him to start insulting them. Can we please play a different game? Hitoshi asked. You are such a sore loser, Aizawa retorted. Before we start the next game we should refill the kettle. Izuku got up and started making more tea. While his back was turned the family of three started signing to each other. Was it just me or did Izuku make a joke? P. We should see if we can get him to do it again H. A. Who knew it would take us being competitive to get him their H. A. Deal H. Itoshi and Aizawa shook hands as Izuku turned around. I. What was the other card game? Izashi asked. Izuku smiled evilly. I. Why yes. Izashi stuttered as he saw the smile on Izuku's face. Izuku cleaned up Uno with Hitoshi's help. Then he set up poker he explained the rules. Can we do an open hand first? Hitoshi asked. Everyone agreed this would be a good idea. Once everyone was comfortable and felt they knew the game they started their first real hand. They are playing Texas Hold'em Poker BTW the rules for those who don't know I will explain right now. If you know them then just skip this to the actual game. Okay so the goal is to make the best 5 card hand. It's also about getting the most chips. White chips are $1. Red chips are $5. Blue chips are $10. Green chips are $25. Black chips are $100. The players bet off how good their potential hand is. The betting calls are as follows. Call matching another player's bet. Raise increasing the size of the existing bet in a round of betting. Fold quilting giving up any chips. Bets you have put into the pot. Check until the first bet in a round has been made players can choose not to bet. But once a bet is placed you have to either call, raise or fold. All in is putting all your chips in at the same time. Some other terms to know. The pot the chips that have been better in a pile in the middle called a pot. Dealer person who handles cards in the pot. The role of dealer usually changes to a different player in a clockwise direction after each round. The dealer does not play or bet until he passes the roll on. Bluffing. Pretending you have higher cards than you do by keeping a poker face or by betting high. 
The actual steps of the game. The dealer gives everyone two cards. These cards are cards you don't show anyone. These are your cars and your cards only. They are your secret weapon. After looking at these cards the first round of betting begins. The flop, the dealer puts down three cards face up. These are the community cards. You are trying to make the best five card hand. The next betting round starts. You bet off how much your two cards and the community cards help you. But you also bet on the next potential card. The turn, takes a card from the deck and adds it down the community cards. There are now four community cards. Every player still only has two private cards. The third round of betting. You are betting off the hand you can make and the potential of the fifth card. The river, the dealer adds another card to the community cards. There are now five community cards. Every player has two private cards. The fourth and last round of betting. You bet on the hand you can make and how confident you are it will beat another player's. This round goes until everyone is done betting or until everyone folds. The showdown. The showdown can happen at any time if there are two players left but if more the two make it to the fourth round of betting then that's when the round ends. Everyone shows their five card hand they made from the community cards and their two private cards. The player with the highest hand gets the pot. If a tie then the pot is split between the two. The chips go to the player on the dealer's left. At the end are each round of cards the pot gets pushed to the winning player's chip pile. The game is played until one player wins all the chips. Once you are out of chips you are out of the game. Card combinations from best to worst. Royal flush, king, queen, jack, ten and ace all in the same suit. Straight flush, five cards in numerical or rank order all the same suit. Four of a kind, the same number or face card in all suits and an extra. Full house, three of the same number or face with two other cards that are also same number or face from two different suits. Flush, all cards from the same suit. Straight, five in a numerical or rank order cards in a row not same suit. Three of a kind, three cards with the same number or face in three different suits. Two random cards, two pair, two cards that have same number or face in two different suits. But there are two of these so there is one unmatched card. Pair, two cards same face or number in two different suits. Other three cards random. High card, you don't have any matches, straights or flushes so you hope your best value card is higher than the other players. Aces are high. The start of poker game. Chip values. White, $1. Red, $5. Blue, $10. Green, $25. Black, $100. Izuku was the dealer. Everyone had 50 white chips, 20 red chips, 10 blue chips, 5 green chips and 2 black chips. Izuku dealer the first two cards. As Ashi was the first given the choice to bet. He checked. Aizawa put in the pot. Raise, he said. Call. Hitoshi threw in his two chips. They all looked to Hizashi. Fine. Call Hizashi said throwing his in. Since no one was gonna raise Izuku placed the flop. Hizashi groaned. Aizawa and Hitoshi stayed straight faced. Hizashi was first up. Fold. He threw down his cards. Aizawa threw in two whites. Raise. Hitoshi put in two white then added a red. Call. Aizawa matched. I. Both players nodded. Cards were placed down. Itoshi won with a pair of 9 seconds Aizawa lost with a pair of 5 seconds. Izuku collected the cards then gave the deck to Hizashi. Hizashi dealt out the first two cards. Everyone checked. Hizashi did the flop. Aizawa looked around to Hitoshi and Izuku. Hitoshi didn't have a great poker face and he could see the small tells of a bad hand. Aizawa looked at Izuku. Nothing. There was nothing. There was no emotion there was no tells whatsoever as Aizawa stared at Izuku for a while then something on his face changed. Aizawa bet a red chip. Everyone called. Azashi placed the turn. Aizawa bet a blue. Fold. Hitoshi put his cards down showing a pair. Izuku said as as he placed his blue then then added a green. Fold. Aizawa put down his cards. He had a two pair. Izuku smiled. He put down his cards. It was a high card of ten. What? Hitoshi yelled. Why did you bet so high if you didn't have good cards? Azashi asked. Izuku signed this with an evil grin. Dad how did you not catch that? You are the king of catching people in lies, Hitoshi asked. Honestly have no idea that he has a good poker face. Aizawa shrugged I am going to get you back though. I, Hizashi passed the cards to Aizawa so he could deal. When Hizashi got his cards he tried hiding his smile but it wasn't working. Hitoshi looked at Izuku. No emotions. Aizawa did the flop. Hitoshi bet two reds. Izuku called but didn't raise. Hizashi called then raised. Adding a green. Hitoshi threw a green in. Izuku hesitated before putting a green in. All players caught this. Aizawa added the next card. Hizashi was practically shaking in his chair with excitement. Hitoshi looks between Hizashi and Izuku. He then looks at his dad as if to ask how to bet. Aizawa shrugged. Hey dealer you can't help him. Hizashi accused. I wasn't helping him. I was just shrugging. Aizawa defended himself. Hizashi gave him a skeptical look. Chick. Hitoshi said. Izuku. Raised by 20. Hizashi put in two blues. Ko. Hitoshi said. Izuku hesitated a bit before putting his two in. 
The round of betting was done so Aizawa put down the final card. Hizashi practically got up and danced. Hitoshi held a poker face. Izuku was blank face. Check Hitoshi said with a little bit of nervousness in his voice. Izuku also checked. Raise. Hizashi put in a green. Hitoshi thought about it then put in a green. Izuku looked like he was going to fold then put his green in. The showdown began. Hitoshi put his cards down first. Hizashi looked happy. Then Izuku put his cards down. Hizashi looked like he was going to cry. What? You bet conservative. I threw in my green. Hizashi yelled. Aye. But you bet low. I thought bluffing was putting more in. Izuku explained. Hizashi looked dumbfounded. Hitoshi was on the ground laughing. This made Izuku grin. Hizashi pouted when Aizawa pushed the pot to Izuku. This made Izuku silently laugh. Everyone stared at Izuku. Izuku looked back like a deer in headlights. Then everyone moved on. It was Hitoshi's turn to deal. Aizawa looked determined so did Hizashi. Izuku looked well. Izuku had a blank face. The cards were handed out. Everyone checked. The flop was set. Izuku bet a blue. Hizashi called. So did Aizawa. The next card was set. Izuku bet another blue. Hizashi folded leaving Izuku and Aizawa. They made eye contact. They both stared into the other's soul. Hitoshi and Hizashi looked at each other in confusion. Then out of nowhere there seemed to be an understanding between the two. Izuku placed his cards down. Bye. What just happened? Hitoshi asked. Not sure kiddo but I am pretty sure there is black magic going on. Hizashi answered. Aizawa did in fact have a higher hand. Hitoshi and Hizashi looked between Aizawa and Izuku. They both seemed completely fine not like Izuku just read Aizawa's mind. The game went on like this until it was just Izuku and Hitoshi. Aizawa and Hizashi took turns dealing. Izuku had almost all the chips. Hitoshi had three whites, two red, one blue, three greens and two black. The first cards went out. Hitoshi had given up trying to read Izuku a long time ago. Izuku put in one blue. Call, Hitoshi said tiredly. It was pretty late but no one wanted to stop they were going until there was an ultimate winner. There was a chance Hitoshi could win back some chips and start making a comeback. The flop was placed. Izuku placed down two blacks. Hitoshi sighed and placed his two black chips in. The next card was placed. Izuku put in three green with a smile. Hitoshi gave a mocking smile back. All in bitches. Hitoshi said as he pushed his remaining chips in. Izuku put in the equivalent from his pile of chips. Because Hitoshi couldn't bet anymore they skipped right to the showdown. Hitoshi placed his cards first he had a flush. Izuku smiled then showed he had four of a kind. Hitoshi grumbled then fell to the floor. Aizawa chuckled. I am never betting against Izuku again. Izashi says. It's not fair. He has a face of stone. Hitoshi Hell grumbled from the floor. Izuku started laughing. The family looked at Izuku in surprise. This was their first time seeing or hearing him actually laugh. Izuku noticed and stopped laughing suddenly. Aye, there is no reason to be sorry we have just never heard you laugh. Hizashi shrugged trying to fix the atmosphere. Aizawa looked at the clock. Shit, I am late for my patrol it's 10 I was supposed to train with Chera. I have to go. I think we should all go it's late and Izuku probably wants some peace. Hitoshi said. Aizawa left right then he had to go home and get into his gear. Hitoshi and Hizashi helped Izuku clean up then left. Izuku scrambled to get his gear the second they were out of the building then get into the middle of the red light district. If he wanted to sell that cherub and Izuku were different people he needed to be out and about like he had been there for a while. He also had to be mad at Eraserhead. Chapter 18 Panic Summary Cherub is mad and Aizawa panics. T-R-I-G-E-R Warning Mean Author Violence Blood Notes Chapter Text Izuku started his patrol trying to get ahead so it looked like he had been out since 9. He knew he had to separate Izuku and Cherub so he would have to act mad when Eraserhead found him. He was going to be mad because Eraserhead blew him off. He felt bad doing it but he had to act right. He was doing his route like he usually would. Then he heard the running of Eraserhead. Izuku turned saw Eraserhead heading toward him. Izuku prepared himself and tried to switch into Cherub's mindset. Cherub crossed his arms and waited for Eraserhead. Eraserhead got there he was very out of breath. Cherub I am so sorry. I had a family matter that I couldn't leave it was an emergency, Eraserhead said. Now Izuku actually was annoyed because Eraserhead lied. Cherub signed frustratedly. I don't have your phone number. There is no way to contact you. It would be great if I could though, Eraserhead answered having caught his breath now. Cherub glared at Aizawa then signed out his number. Cherub signed then turned and continued his patrol. Aizawa was impressed with the apartment Izuku was able to get. He liked the setup it was simple and practical. He liked the food Izuku made it was good and he was surprised that he liked it because he didn't usually like Katsun. He had been trying to watch the time but when Uno started he got sidetracked. He got focused in and was having fun. When Izuku jokingly insulted Hitoshi he was shocked which not a lot shocks him anymore. This meek kid who felt bad asking for seconds, apologized for dropping his chopsticks, who would get on the ground bowing if you bumped into him. 
just roasted Hitoshi. It made him happy to know the kid was getting comfortable. They had learned about some of his story over the past few months. This poor kid was given up by his mother he ended up in foster care were from what his ashy. Hitoshi and Aizawa could guess from small tells he was not treated well then ended up getting emancipated. He was happy that his family thought the same and they made it a mission. Now Aizawa was not expecting poker to go the way it did. He didn't think Izuku would be as cutthroat as he was. It kind of reminded him of someone but he couldn't place who. When Izuku and Aizawa had their first showdown he realized who Izuku reminded him of. The calculated eyes that went blank not showing emotion reminded him of Cherub. This realization caught him off guard. Aizawa couldn't help but laugh at his husband. He knew Hazashi wasn't going to have a great poker face but he didn't expect it to be this bad. Itoshi didn't surprise him too much. During the second Izuku Aizawa stare down he didn't know what Izuku saw that made him full. Aizawa had been searching for any sign of what Izuku's cards were but the kid didn't give anything so he switched to offensive now just looking at the kid not into the kid. He was surprised when the kid folded. When he saw the time he panicked. He realized he wasn't very nice to Izuku with the way he left but he hadn't been nice to another kid either so it evened out. He was scared that he had ruined all the work he had done and the progress him and Cherub had made. The kid had finally started to relax a bit around him and stopped keeping up his full guard every time he was near. He thought it was funny that the kid would spar with him but then outside of sparring he wouldn't let him in arm's reach of him. Arm's reach was generous it usually was like 8 feet of space. He had to apologize as soon as possible. He was lucky that he found him so quickly. He had just gotten on patrol. He had run from his home her which wasn't easy then jumping from building to building wasn't easy either so when he stopped to apologize he was out of breath to say the least. When he gave his excuse he saw Cherub flinch but wrote it off. After apologizing he went on his own patrol. He felt bad lying but he didn't know Cherub enough to tell him stuff about his very personal life yet. Maybe that's why the kid hasn't opened up. As much as I don't know him he also doesn't know me. Someone has to start and I am guessing it has to be me. Aizawa decided he would start talking more so him and Cherub were more comfortable with each other by the time they went to UA to train in five days. He was happy he could train the kid more but he wasn't happy with the price he had to pay to Nezu. He had to give Nezu all the information he had on Cherub and by everything he meant everything. Nezu didn't give a reason. Aizawa didn't expect a reason. He would have to inform Cherub about Nezu before Thursday since there was a chance Nezu would come into their training to meet Cherub. Nezu liked mysteries or he liked solving mysteries and currently that is what Cherub was. Aizawa would make a file for Nezu tomorrow and send it in. He knew Nezu wanted every single detail. He hated doing this because Cherub was his project and his worry. He also wanted the kid to reveal himself not be forced to. To be honest if he wanted Nezu to look into anyone he wanted him to look into Izuku. He trusted the kid but he also wanted to understand his past. As a hero, a parent and teacher it worried him that a kid was as mistreated and beat down as Izuku. He wanted to help Izuku like he had helped Hitoshi. He wanted the kid to tell him what had happened but with how it was going he had a suspicion that if he didn't dig he never would get the answers. He had once talked to Hizashi about this and found he was thinking similarly. He was reminded why he fell in love with his husband. They decided to wait for two more months then ask Nezu to look. Tonight they were having Sunday dinner with Izuku he would apologize then for running out. His patrol had ended so he was heading home. He couldn't wait to cuddle up in bed and sleep. He was woken up by yelling. He looked over at his clock to see it was two in the afternoon. The yelling sounded panicked he jumped up grabbed his capture scarf and ran out of his room. He jumped down the stairs running into the main room. He was stopped in his tracks. Hizashi was pressing down on Izuka's side. Hitoshi was on the phone while Hizashi was yelling information at him. He ran over to Hizashi and saw Izuku had stab wounds on his torso. Hizashi was trying to put pressure on them but they're wet more than he could hold. Aizawa joined holding wounds. Izuku was shallowly breathing. He got here earlier than usual. He was fine then all of a sudden collapsed that's when we saw blood on his hoodie. We took it off to find his undershirt soaked with blood. Show I have no idea how he got these. Hizashi was trying not to look panicked but his voice betrayed him. He was trying to stay calm for Hitoshi's sake. Hitoshi still on the phone with what Aizawa now realized was an ambulance he looked panickedly at Aizawa as if asking if his friend would be okay. Aizawa had no answer. Sirens could be heard outside the door. Hitoshi opened the door for them. The paramedics ran and shoot Aizawa and Hizashi away. They picked the kid up put him on the stretcher then ran out. The family watched as the ambulance sped off. Chapter 19 A Whole Lot of Sleep Summary Izuku goes to the hospital. We loved Aizawa. Notes Chapter Text Hitoshi was scared. His best and only friend had come over early to hang out more. He was a little more pale and sluggish than usual but he said he was fine just tired and was coming down with a cold. They were going into the kitchen to grab a snack when Izuku mumbled something that Hitoshi's couldn't make it out. Hitoshi turned around just as Izuku fell. He made a loud thump as his body hit the ground. After a second of shock he yelled for his pops who was in his office doing work. 
he didn't answer. Hitoshi ran to his pop's office bursting and then waving his hands at his pop who didn't have his hearing aids in. He gestured for him to follow him before running back to Izuku. Hizashi ran out gasped then started analyzing Izuku. Hitoshi saw blood on Izuku's hoodie. It was growing. He pointed it out to his pops who then took off Izuku's sweatshirt to reveal a bloody undershirt. Hizashi in a slurred voice told him to grab the first aid kit and to call an ambulance. It took a second for this to process in Hitoshi's head before he ran to the kitchen keyboard under the sink and grabbed the first aid kit which he threw to his dad before he ran to grab his phone from the living room. The video game they had been playing still going on the TV. How could this happen? Izuku was fine one second then not the next. He dialed 110. He was back in the kitchen. His pops hadn't even opened the first aid kit to busy holding as many wounds on Izuku closed as he could at once. His pops started yelling information at him to relay to the operator. He knew his pops couldn't tell how loud he was being so he let it go. The operator started asking questions about Izuku he didn't know, like what his blood type was or weight. He tried to explain that Izuku was a friend and he didn't know these things. His dad ran down the stairs looking ready to fight. His dad ran over to help his pops. The operator told him what hospital they would be taking Izuku to. Itoshi with his eyes asked his dad if Izuku would be okay. His dad just averted his eyes. Itoshi got up and opened the door for the paramedics. They ran in. They picked Izuku up like it was nothing then strapped him onto the stretcher before running out. He went to the door to watch them pack his best friend up and leave. When he couldn't hear the ambulance anymore he turned in shock to his parents who were behind him. His dads were covered in Izuku's blood. He looked behind them to where Izuku had just been. There was a small puddle of blood. It all hit Hitoshi. He had been running on adrenaline and now it was over. He started crying and couldn't stop. His best friend had just been taken out of their house on a stretcher after collapsing. His dad showed up in front of him. His pop still had blood on his hands and some on his shirt. His dad looked disheveled. He still had his hair in the braid he put it in before sleeping he didn't even have a shirt on he was only in his shorts. His dad had been asleep. His dad had washed his hands while Pops was trying to calm Hitoshi down from his panic attack. His dad hugged Hitoshi. This helped. He started calming down. He could hear his dad telling him it was okay that Izuku would be fine. That it wasn't his fault. He then heard what he himself was saying. Why didn't he tell me? Why didn't I notice? He is my friend and I didn't notice he was bleeding out till he collapsed. Hitoshi stopped saying this. His pops showed up with no blood on him he was changed and was holding a change of clothes for dad and him. Once he was calmed down he accepted the clothes and got changed in his room. He packed a bag for the hospital. He was going to stay with Izuku for as long as he was in there. He grabbed some stuff for Izuku to then walk downstairs his dads were getting ready to go too. He loved his dad's dot they all piled into the car and left for the hospital. When they got there they were told to sit and wait. After a long time a doctor came out. Are you his guardians? No he is emancipated but we are the closest thing he has to family so we are here to take care of him. Okay well there was some pretty bad damage. We had to regrow some organs since they were either too damaged to function or stabbed. We did stitch him up. He lost a lot of blood and we had to tap into our blood bank to save him the bad news is he since he doesn't have health insurance we will not be healing him the rest of the way. And our doctors are not comfortable working on a quirkless more than they have had to. A nurse will show you to him. The doctor said before walking away. Looking at his dad's he saw the anger in their eyes at what he had said. Hitoshi was fuming. They weren't going to treat Izuku fully because he was quirkless. It's their jobs. They waited for a nurse to come but one didn't so they went to the front desk who called a nurse. When she showed up she looked surprised. Oh when the doctor said to lead the family to the kid's room I thought he was joking. What is that supposed to mean? His dad growled out. The nurse not having a clue answered. Well he is quirkless so I thought the doctor was joking. His dad's eyes started to glow red but then his pops patted him on the shoulder. They were lead to a room where Izuku was. He would have looked peaceful if it wasn't for the mask on his face and all the wires on him. He had IV and a blood pouch attached to his arm. He was in a hospital gown but Hitoshi could still see the bandages poking up around his neck and down his arms. He should wake up at some point. Call one of the nurses when he does so we can give him some pain meds. He is going to be in pain when he wakes up. She left before my dad or pops could yell at her. Hitoshi pulled a chair up to his bed and held Izuka's hand. He realized this was the first time he had seen Izuku in anything other than long sleeve clothes. He could see the scars littering his forearms. He saw more scars poking from the bandages that stopped mid-bicep. Izuku looked pale and sickly. He started tearing up at the sight of his best friend. His pop seeming to sense this walked over and placed a hand on Hitoshi's shoulder. Hitoshi looked up to see his pops was in the room but not his dad. His pops had put in his hearing aids before they left so he asked, Where did dad go? He went to go see if he could find somebody in this hospital willing to help the kid. And he is going to go call the insurance company to add Izuku on the plan so he is paid for. His pops explained. Itoshi was shocked but not to shocked. 
Wanna bet he yells at some nurses and doctors? He might. His pops muse then added, if he does they deserve it. Izuku is human too he deserves treatment just as much as anyone else does. Hitoshi nodded in agreement. His pops pulled up the other chair and sat with Hitoshi. It was 30 minutes later when his dad stormed in. He paced while he explained what he happened while he was gone. The stupid doctors and nurses all refused to take care of him. They said they had done enough and didn't need more. They said they were too busy to make sure Izuku wasn't in pain. One of them was literally sitting there on her phone doing nothing. I also learned just how injured he is. The doctor explained it like the kid was okay. Nope. He had a half-collapsed lung from a hole since he was stabbed there. His liver was cut in half. His small intestine was severed in multiple places. His arms were all cut up. There was so much going on no this stupid doctor acted as if it was fine. He even complained that they had to use blood to keep him alive. Then I called the insurance it took 5 minutes of convincing to add Izuku on. His dad's quirk was activated. Itoshi was pissed so were his dad's. How did Izuku do all he was doing if he was this hurt? I mean he walked to our house and was playing video games with me like everything was fine. All three turned to Izuku. There was a grimace on his sleeping face but otherwise he looked okay. I am not sure kiddo but he must be pretty strong to do that, his pops said solemnly. He was fine last night. Itoshi said as he looked down at his and Izuka's hands. He felt his pops rubbing his back. His dad pulled up a chair and sat on the other side of Hitoshi. I am going to call Chio. I will see if I can get Izuku to UA or have Chio come here so she can help Izuku. More needs to be done for him and it's clear this hospital won't. His dad said before getting up and stepping out into the hallway to call Chio. Call the rat too and report this hospital to him. His pops called into the hallway. Hitoshi grinned at the thought of Nezu dealing with this hospital. After a bit his dad came back into the room. Chio is on her way. She wanted to come to us because in her words that kid has been through enough he doesn't need to be moved again. And I would like to give that hospital a piece of my mind. Then I called Nezu. He said he would take care of costs so we don't have to and I think this hospital is going to be in a lot of trouble. They all sat in silence. His dads went on their phones while Hitoshi kept looking at Izuku hoping he would wake up. I am going to go walk Chio up she just got here. His dad said then left the room. After a bit Chio walked in with dad behind her. She was dressed in her costume. She walked over to Izuku. Hey hun can you go find his doctor? She asked his pops. His pops walked out to go get the doctor. He came back with the doctor who looked surprised when he saw recovery girl. You a recovery girl. I didn't know you would be at our hospital today. This patient is fine why don't I show you some patients that could actually use your attention. The doctor said already going to walk back out of the room. Oh no I am not here to treat other patients right now. I am here to treat this young man here. I need to know his stats so I can help him. Chio said in a tone that made Hitoshi nervous. Well that kid has been healed. I am looking at him right now and he is not healed. So please give me his charts. Chio said passive aggressively. After the doctor handed recovery girl the chart recovery girl hit him on the head with her cane. That is for being a quirkist asshole. The doctor scurried out of the room. Hitoshi smiled. His smile left his face when he heard recovery girl's response to looking at his chart oh dear. He is going to need more than one session. I need him awake so I can get his consent to heal him. Until then I am going to go yell at every nurse and doctor in this hospital. Shio said as she left the room. Hitoshi do you want me to stay or can I go to go on patrol? Dad asked Hitoshi thought about it and decided he wanted his dad here. Can you stay please? Of course. He saw his dad take out his phone and text who he is pretty sure was Cherub. Hitoshi was sometimes jealous of Cherub but he also knew Cherub was a kid that needed help and it was his dad's job. He did think Cherub was cool. He knew his dad was always going to be there for him and he loved that. He heard a muffled groan. He looked up at Izuka's face to see he was slowly opening his eyes. His dad got up and turned off the lights so it wouldn't be too bright. Daylight was still coming in through the window so it wasn't too dark but it wasn't the fluorescent hospital lights. Hitoshi lightly squeezed Izuka's hand he felt a weak squeeze back. Izuku was making a pained expression. His pops pressed the button for the nurse while his dad went to go find Chio. Hey Izuku, my dad is going to be get the nurse so they can give you pain meds. You are in the hospital, Hitoshi said. Izuku looked panicked as he looked down at his body. The beeping from the heart monitor started to speed up. Izuku looked at Hitoshi with panicked eyes. His pops got up and tried to get Izuku to do box breathing. Hitoshi mimicked his pops. Izuku wasn't really calming down fully but he did calm down a bit. The nurse came in. She added some liquid to the IV. Izuku after a few minutes started to calm down and got a groggy look. Hitoshi would have laughed if he wasn't so worried. His dad came back with Chio. Hey sweetie I am recovery girl. I am here to heal you the rest of the way. I need your permission to use my quirk on you. It will make you fall asleep again since it speeds up your healing process. It used a lot of energy. It will take more than one session to heal you. I need a verbal yes to heal you. Can I heal you? Shio he is mute and doesn't talk. Aizawa said, I need some form of yes from him. It's required by law. 
Chiyo answered. Izuku shakily raised his hand and signed yes. That will work, Chiyo said. She walked up to Izuku and kissed him on the forehead. You could physically see the energy drain out of Izuku as he fell back asleep. He probably won't wake up for a while and I will have to do this again but I can't till tomorrow so I am going home. I have no idea what happened to him but it isn't good. Hitoshi didn't like that. It had been a few hours and Hitoshi was getting tired. It was two in the morning. His pops was asleep in his chair. His dad had gone to get everyone a change of clothes. Hitoshi layer his head on the bed. He woke up to sunlight in his face. He quickly looked up to see Izuku was still asleep. Sorry Toshi he hasn't woken up yet. His dad said. What do you think happened? I mean how do you think he got stabbed? My guess would be that someone didn't like him since he was quirkless and tried to teach him a lesson. That is messed up. It is. It's what me and your pops have been trying to teach at the school. It's what your pops has been saying on his radio but it hasn't been enough. The more time that goes on and the less quirkless people there are the more they get mistreated. The part that Ada am realizing now is to Izuku stuff like this might be his norm. You mean he might be used to this sort of thing. Itoshi loved that his dad was always honest with him. He liked that he was treated like he could handle things. Things weren't sugarcoated for him. They didn't really have to be. Itoshi had seen how dark and mean the world can be. He has lived in it. You know the quirkless statistics. I am sorry to say it but yes I think it might be normal for him. He didn't go to the hospital. He didn't seem to be in pain you said and the doctor mentioned that he thinks Izuku did first aid on himself because they had to remove some stitches from the wounds to heal him. Wait Izuku stitched himself up. That's what the doctor said. He actually seemed impressed with how well he did. Do you think Izuku will tell us the truth of what happened? I realize now that a lot of what he said probably wasn't true. I am not sure kid. Me and your pops were thinking about asking Nezu to look into the kid but we were going to wait. Now I am thinking we should do it sooner than later. Would you help him no matter his past? At this point, yes I would do everything I could to help him. He has been nothing but nice and proven himself to me and your pops. If there was something bad in his past I think it would be a lie or something he was forced into. I say do it then. Would you tell me? Would it change your opinion of him? I can't say no. But I think I understand why he would lie but if it's something really bad I think I would change for the better. Then yes I would tell you the results. You should call Nezu. I will. Right then his pops walked back into the room with their breakfast and coffees. After eating his dad gave him a change of clothes. Hitoshi got up to go change. When he got back to the room his dad gave him a thumbs up and said he had called Nezu. Hitoshi was nervous to see what happened to Izuku but he knew it would help him and his dads understand Izuku. He knew Izuku needed help. Izuku wasn't going to tell them what was going on probably so he was happy to know. He felt bad digging without Izuku's permission but it might be necessary. He sat next to Izuku and waited. He was worried for multiple reasons at this point it was a giant list. He was worried because Izuku was in the state he was in. He had started to really like Izuku. He was worried for the kid and honestly saw the kid as his own kid. He was worried about the effect this would have on Hitoshi and he felt really bad this had happened in front of him. He was worried about Cherub. The kid hadn't answered any of his texts. He felt bad leaving the kid but Hitoshi needed him to stay. Cherub could handle well on his own Aizawa was confident of that. He was worried because his Ashi wasn't doing well mentally. He was hiding it from Hitoshi but while Hitoshi was asleep they had stepped out of the room and talked. Hitoshi had called for me and I didn't hear because I didn't have my aids in. I couldn't do enough. I have done first aid on victims so many times and I know exactly what to do but all of a sudden I didn't know what to do. I didn't do half the stuff I was supposed to do. I was stuck. I was there when he walked in show I was there. I am a hero for fuck's sake and I couldn't see the kid was hurting. Love, you did a really good job you probably saved his life. Izuku is more personal than the victims you usually work with. You know him and are friends with him your son is best friends with him. You saw him hurting and panicked it is completely normal. He is also probably really good at acting. You can't help those who don't want to be helped and he didn't want to help. He purposely hid from you that he was hurt. You also weren't looking for it. You are a wonderful person and a wonderful hero. Hizashi gave him a sad smile then hugged him. They stood there hugging for a while before Hizashi decided he would go get breakfast for everyone. He walked back into the room and talked to Hitoshi. When he was done eating the disgusting hospital food he walked out of the room to call the rat. He sighed and almost regretted his choice but he knew it was for the better. The phone was picked up. A cheerful high-pitched voice came through the receiver. Hello Aizawa. What knowledge do you wish to know? How did the rat know? I would like to know the background on the kid I called about earlier. We are worried he didn't tell the truth about what was going on with him. For the safety of him and my family I want you to do a background check on him. I don't know his last name. He was emancipated recently and didn't have a last name. This will be fun. I will send you a file as soon as I am done. The phone call ended. He didn't say a price this scared Aizawa. He walked back into the room soon after Hitoshi walked in. He gave the thumbs up. Around 11.30 am Izuku woke up again. He was doing better this time. He was able to take off his air mask. 
He still looked groggy. It kinda reminded him of a tired cat. As Ashi put food in front of Izuku, he had never seen someone eat so quickly. The kid looked up sheepishly at their shocked faces when Hitoshi started to laugh this soon had his Ashi laughing which caused the corners of Aizawa's lips to raise. Izuku blushed and fiddled with his hands. Now that he was awake he looked a lot, or alive in Aizawa's opinion. The blood tap had been removed some wires were still there but not nearly as many he did still have the IV in. A nurse had come in every few hours to give the kid pain meds. Once you have been awake for a while we will have Chiyo come again to heal you again. Aizawa said. I know this may be a little soon but what happened? Hitoshi asked. Izuku put his head down and shook his head. Please Izuku we want to help. Hitoshi said. Izuku didn't raise his head he kept looking down and picking at his nails. Izuku you scared the crap out of me. The least you can do is tell me what the fuck happened to you. You came over to my house acting fine then all of a sudden collapsed. I watched as you bled out on the floor of my kitchen then had to watch as my pops tried to hold you closed while I talked to the operator then watched as you were rushed out of my house by paramedics. I think I deserve an explanation. Itoshi said with frustration in his eyes. As his son recounted the story he could see tears in his eyes. I thought you were going to die. I thought you were dead. Itoshi added. Izuku looked at Itoshi tears in his eyes. Izuku signed before looking back down. The kid wiped his eyes. Itoshi got up and walked out of the room. Aizawa looked at Hizashi who nodded. Aizawa went after Hitoshi while Hizashi stayed with Izuku. He followed Hitoshi. Dad please let me be for a bit. I will once you talk to me. Fine. Hitoshi turned around to him. Okay what happened? I know Izuku went through something and I feel really bad but shouldn't he tell us? He literally almost died in front of us and expects that we just don't talk about it. I don't think he expects us not to talk about it I think he more of just isn't ready yet to talk about it. He probably just went through something pretty traumatic. You can be mad that is valid but while you are mad I need you to also remember the fact that he is probably scared and in pain. Knowing him he is probably also embarrassed that we had to help him. Remember how you didn't immediately tell us what was going on with you. I know that and I get that but we have known him for over three months and he still won't tell us. He just woke up from a very traumatic experience. Give him some slack. He is having a hard time and just isn't ready yet. He might be ready soon. Put yourself in his shoes and try to think like you did when we first adopted you. I completely understand where you are coming from and I am going to let you walk around for however long you want but I am going to go back and call Chiyo so the kid can get healed. Hitoshi gave him a thumbs up then walked away. Once Hitoshi was around the corner Aizawa called Ichio and started heading back to the room. When he got back Izuku was looking at his hands and fiddling while Hizashi sat with him. Hitoshi is just walking around. He is going to get some coffee. Aizawa sat down. Izuku signed without looking up. He isn't mad. He is frustrated. Give him a second and he should be okay. You aren't at fault. Take your time getting ready. I will ask that as a hero you talk to either me or Hizashi. I understand if you aren't ready to talk yet. Chiyo is on her way to heal you some more. Is there anything you want or need before you sleep again? Aizawa explained. He saw Izuku blush then sheepishly sign while blushing. Izuku somehow turned more red. I will get a nurse to help you. Aizawa said then he walked out to get a nurse. As Ashi and Aizawa waited outside as Izuku was taken to the in-room bathroom. Aizawa's phone rang he saw it was Chiyo so he walked down to get her. Aizawa was also curious about what happened to Izuku and wanted to know. He got a Chiyo then walked up again. Izuku was back in bed and Hazashi was sitting there. Hitoshi was still gone. Aizawa sent a quick text telling Hitoshi that Chiyo was here and Izuku would be sleeping again soon. Hello again young man. You look better than the last time I saw you. Chiyo joked. I need to change your bandages and see your injuries. Do you want me to kick Hazashi and Aizawa out or can they stay? Izuku thought about it then signed. Izuku looked sheepish. Of course little listener. Hazashi and him both walked out of the room and got comfortable. They had pulled three chairs out into the hallway. Shio walked out for a second to get a nurse to help and to go get new bandages and disinfectant wipes. After a while Hitoshi showed up. There was evidence of him crying but there was not a tear in sight now. Aizawa moved over a seat so Hitoshi could sit between him and Hazashi. Why are we out here? Hitoshi asked. Hezuka's bandages needed to be changed. We decided to give him privacy. Okay. How long have they been working? Hazashi looked at his watch then said. About 20 minutes. It should be a bit longer. They ended up waiting for another 10-ish minutes before Chiyo came to get them. Izuku was sleeping soundly. There were no visible bandages anymore. Chiyo asked Hizashi and Aizawa into the hallway so they could talk. The poor kid had scars all over him. I mean everywhere. There were cuts looking like knives and burns. I am honestly pretty worried. There was literally a group of scars across his back like someone had dragged hands that had blades for fingernails across him. They were in multiple places. Chiyo said gravely. Hizashi paled. How old are they? Aizawa asked. Some are older than others but this kid has been getting wounded enough to scar regularly. 
Some are new as in still pinkish. Hizashi and Aizawa gave each other concerned looks. He is healing a lot better than I thought he would so he should be fine once he wakes up. I would keep him at your house for a bit to keep an eye on him. Both males nodded. The little old lady walked back down the hall to leave. Aizawa and Hizashi walked back into the room. They pretended to not notice the noise of Hitoshi running back to his seat. He had been eavesdropping. He is going to be okay and should be fine after this round. We are going to see if he can stay with us for a few days to make sure everything is okay. Hizashi explained before sitting down. They sat and waited. At seven the kid woke up. A Jose was called. He was given his personal belongings and they started the process of being discharged. Aizawa explained the plan to have Izuku stay a few days to make sure he was okay. Izuku was not happy about this but did agree. When Aizawa mentioned they should swing by his place to get clothes he didn't look excited he honestly looked nervous. When Aizawa had gotten clothes he had grabbed an extra of Hitoshi's for Izuku since Izuku shouldn't have to wear his bloody clothes. They left the room so Izuku could get dressed then they headed to the front desk to do the last bit of paperwork. Once that was done they all piled into the car and started heading for Izuku's. They all went up with him to help him pack and to carry it down. They didn't want him having to do more than he had to. What they were not expecting when they walked into the room was the smell of blood. They looked around and quickly found the culprits. There were bloody clothes on the floor and first aid equipment. Hazashi audibly gasped. A blushing Izuku started picking everything up. Aizawa went over and helped. Hizashi was frozen in the doorway. Hitoshi looked both sad angry and frustrated at the same time. He left walking down to the car. Aizawa decided this might be for the best. Hizashi then also left leaving just Izuku and Aizawa. Izuku signed. It's fine kid you weren't expecting to have company. Will you tell me now what happened? Aizawa asked. Izuku signed as he chucked the clothes into his trash can. Izuku grabbed a bag from a by the door and started angrily shoving stuff into his bag. Aizawa went into the bathroom to grab the kid's toiletries. He walked in and stopped. There is blood on the tiled floor. A stitching kit sat in the sink with scissors. His mirror was open where a bunch of different medications sat. There was bloody hand prints on the sink. Aizawa walked back into the main room grabbing paper towels from the kitchen counter deciding to ignore the bottle of high-strength pain medication sitting next to a half-drank cup of water. He went back into the bathroom. He started cleaning up the blood so it wouldn't stain. Izuku showed up behind him. Aizawa grabbed the toiletries from the shower then passed it to Izuku who put it in his bag. The kid then picked up the bloody paper towels and left to throw them away. Aizawa grabbed the roll to put back on the counter. They walked down the stairs over to the car. Hitoshi sat in the back. He wiped his face as they approached. He saw Izuku deflate a bit in the corner of his eye. As Ashi sat in the front he didn't look great. They got into the car and started the silent ride home. When they walked in. Hitoshi immediately walked up to his room. Hazashi showed Izuku the guest room. Aizawa started the kettle. He had a feeling there was a hot cocoa discussion coming. He leaned against the sink. He rubbed his face trying to relieve the tightness. He heard Hazashi come in and sit at the table. He had his face in his hands. Aizawa barely heard Hazashi mumble out. He is going to take a shower then he wants to tell us what happened. Okay, I am going to go up and talk to Hitoshi in a bit. Are you okay? I just can't believe I didn't notice. You saw how bloody his clothes were. I am just disappointed Aiden myself. Love there is no reason to be disappointed in yourself. Like I said before you weren't looking for it and he is a good actor. I mean think about the poker game he completely fooled us all. I think you should go lay down for a bit and take a second. You have been trying to stay strong for Hitoshi for the past two days. What about you? I had my time when I came back to clean up and grab people's clothes. I also will probably have mine later. It was at that moment that Hizashi noticed the blood puddle and any evidence of what had happened was gone. I love you show. Thank you. Aizawa nodded then headed for the stairs. He took a breath then headed upstairs. He knocked on Hitoshi's door. It opened. Can I come in? Yes. Aizawa walked into Hitoshi's room closing the door behind him. He pulled up Hitoshi's desk chair so he was opposite of him where he was sitting on his bed. Izuku is going to take a shower then tell us what happened. I am a king hot cocoa. Are you okay? I don't know. I am not mad at Izuku. I am mad at myself. I ate his best friend and didn't know he was hurt. I was right there and didn't know. I am sad because seeing his apartment and his bloody clothes made me realize how close we were to losing him. And that he was going through that alone. He must have been scared. And I am frustrated because we have done so much and proved we are trustworthy but he decided to go through that alone and didn't tell us. Every single one of Elf those feeling is valid. You need to remember that Izuku is probably used to going through stuff alone. He probably trusts you but didn't want to scare you. Try to remember that Izuku is an amazing actor. Remember the poker game. If he wanted help he would have asked. Asking for help can be very hard and scary. It is sad to know he went through that. He probably was scared. I am so 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 sorry that you had to see what you did. No one should have to see their best friend bleeding out. I am sending you to a therapist for a bit if it's okay with you. 
I also want you to know something. It is frustrating helping someone and they don't return the favor. This isn't the reason you should help people. You should help people because you want to. Sometimes you will help someone and they will get mad at you. Others when you help they will pay you back. And sometimes you will help someone and nothing will happen. Aizawa explained. Thank you dad. I am willing to go to therapy. I will go downstairs with you to get the hot cocoa ready. Itoshi said. He didn't seem really happy with Aizawa's response but that was okay. Going downstairs they got the mugs out and everything else they needed for hot cocoa. They would let everyone make their hot cocoa the way they wanted so they set it up in the middle of the table then waited. While they waited Itoshi suddenly talked. He talked to me. What? Before Izuku collapsed we were heading to the kitchen for a snack when I suddenly heard him say something. I didn't hear what but he talked. He talked dad. Aizawa turned around in surprise at Itoshi. At that moment they heard Hizashi come in and Izuku not far behind. They all sat at the table. The discussion began. Chapter 20 That hurt like a butt cheek on a stick. Summary Izuku sighed. Trigger warning. Scars. Violence. Blood. Description of pain. Dissociation. Panic attack. Gore. Notes. Chapter text. Izuku had finished his patrol and was back at his apartment. He went to go get food from the fridge to realize it was almost empty. He checked his cupboards to find they were also almost empty. He didn't have all the ingredients to make one thing he had most and then was missing a key ingredient. Izuku looked at the time. 4 am no store he needed would be open so he decided to wait till 8. Izuku went to bed setting an alarm. At 7.45 he woke up turned off his alarm clock then got up. He went to his closet grabbing his usual wardrobe of a long sleeve shirt and some cargo pants. Putting some money in his bag and putting sneakers on he left for the store. The store he was going to was towards the richer part of town. It would have taken him 15 minutes but he had bought second hand bike so it should cut his time in half. One problem he had never noticed since he didn't have pop able tired for feet was just how much broken glass was scattered over the red light district. He was trying to avoid it but that got pretty much impossible as he went by a bar. Then like he guessed it with the tire popped. He got off sighing. There goes the hope of cutting down my commute time. He was so annoyed about the bike and out of it he didn't notice the group following him. He walked the bike then saw a dumpster he walked into the alley to put it next to the dumpster so it would hopefully get picked up. He was busy trying to get the bike to lean against the dumpster when his grown out hair was grabbed. He was pulled back then thrown to the ground. Izuku landed on his ass and hands. He looked up only to be faced with Tatsuki. Haruki and two other kids he recognized from the group home. There was one he didn't. Izuku's brain had fogged the second his hair was grabbed. See I told you it was him Tatsuki. Haruki said. Izuku realized now how close he was to the group home. He had completely forgotten but in his excitement of getting an apartment he hadn't realized he was two miles from the group home. I can't believe we caught him. Tatsuki said. There was something different about him. It clocked. He had a crooked nose. His words were a little weird and he was cross-eyed. Izuku was happy to see he had an effect on the kid. He has changed a bit from the last time we saw him. One of the kids he recognized said, Izuku could, to place her name. Izuku was frozen. He was suddenly his old weak self. All the knowledge he had learned over the past two years was gone. I think you should get him back for what he did. Haruki said to Tatsuki. I should. Tatsuki turned to the unknown kids and said, This is how you teach a quirkless kid a lesson. And get rid of him at the same time. Haruki. When he said the kid's name he put his hand out. Haruki materialized a knife out of his hand and put it in Tatsuki's. This is gonna suck. Izuku thought. Before we cut him. Does anyone was a hit on him? Tatsuki asked. Haruki nodded and started what was about to be one of the worst beatings Izuku would ever have. The kid Izuku didn't recognize didn't join until the two he did recognize joined Haruki. Tatsuki stayed back watching what was happening grinning like a sadist. Izuku curled into a ball keeping his face hidden. If he survived he was supposed to go to the Yamada Aizawa house for dinner. He didn't want to worry them so he tried to keep his face from getting hit. After a bit of taking hits it stopped as Tatsuki gave the command. It's my turn to mess this guy up. Tatsuki walked up to Izuku grabbing him by his hair and lifting him as much as he could. This made Izuku uncurl. Izuku's head didn't feel right. He couldn't focus he couldn't think and his body wasn't moving. Then all of a sudden everything came into focus as he was stabbed. If he thought it hurt going in it hurt more coming out. He couldn't breathe. It hurt so much. Then the knife stabbed his stomach again. He heard someone shout. The world went back out of focus the only thing registering was the pain. The knife stabbed him three more times. Two of the three he felt it turn. He couldn't breathe he couldn't do anything. On the last one he felt himself get dropped as someone pulled Tatsuki away. Tatsuki's boots appeared in Izuku's vision from where he lay crumpled on the ground. He felt cold. He felt the knife run along his arms slicing randomly. He repeated this on his legs. He didn't go deep and he didn't do it often. Izuku was frozen. He could hear talking but he couldn't make out words. It sounded like it was a different language. He refused to cry. That was what kept him from passing out. He refused to cry. 
After a while they left. As if on autopilot Izuku got up. He doesn't know how but he does. He has to. He refuses to be another statistic. He hold the bigger wounds trying to help himself. He shuffles back to his apartment no doubt leaving a blood trail. He knew he was probably getting weird looks but he didn't care he had to survive. Luckily Tatsuki wasn't too strong and hadn't cut too deep. He was shirtless in front of his mirror. He had a towel in his mouth so he didn't scream as he shakily tried to stitch himself up. He did the best first aid he could. He even glued over the stitches. It was nearly impossible to do his own arms but he managed. Those cuts were not deep at all but it would be better to be safe rather than sorry. When he messed up for the billionth time on his arm he threw the needle and stitching kit into the sink before limping over to his kitchen he turned hit hot plate onto the max then grabbed one of his meat knives' as blade on the hot plate. He waited till it was hot enough and then reciting the towel he pressed it to the cut. It hurt but didn't hurt as bad as being stabbed. He successfully cauterized the wounds on his arms then did the same for his legs. He went to his first aid kit that was in the middle of the floor he grabbed some alcohol wipes. He wiped down the burned areas then wrapped them in a bandage. He sat on his futon being as careful as possible. He stared at the opposite wall. Something came over him because he looked at the clock. It was 10.10. He decided he would go over to the Yamada Aizawa house early. He picked out some clothes. He added on a hoodie even though it was a warm day because if he bled through his shirt he didn't want them to see. He wasn't sure why he was still going over. It felt right. Also he didn't want to stay in the red light district right now. He grabbed some of his heavier duty painkillers and took four. It was too much but he didn't care. He froze outside his door. What if they were waiting? No he can't let them win and make him stay home. He left his house making a slower than usual trek to the Yamada Aizawa household. Hitoshi looked surprised to see him. He realized in his fog he hadn't texted. Oops. Hizashi didn't notice him come in until Hitoshi stomped on the floor. That's a rude way to get your parents' attention Izuku thought but then he realized why Hitoshi had stomped. Hizashi turned then saw Hitoshi. Izuku is here early. Hitoshi signed to Hizashi, who in a slurred speech answered with, Hey Izuku. It hit Izuku then that Hizashi was deaf. That's why Hitoshi Aizawa and Hizashi all knew sign language. I am honestly dumb for not realizing that earlier. Hitoshi went into the living room. Izuku followed. Hitoshi grabbed another controller handing it to Izuku. Izuku hadn't know how to play video games and when Hitoshi learned this he freaked out damn ding he learned so Hitoshi taught Izuku. Izuku sat down next to Hitoshi. Bastard walked over rubbing up against Izuku then plopped into Izuku's criss-cross leg. They started playing a before quirk game called Super Mario Hitoshi was always Mario while Izuku was always Luigi. After a while of playing Hitoshi decided it was time to get a snack. Izuku picked up Bastard off him. As he did this he both felt and heard a popping coming from his abdomen he tried to cover a wince with a cough which ended up being a stupider idea because that caused more stitches to pop and wounds to open. Izuku was in pain but he didn't want to show it. He got up which caused more stitches to pop. Fuck. He could feel some blood seeping. He got dizzy as he stood but he ignored it. As he followed Hitoshi every step he got dizzier. And more sluggish. His body was getting harder and harder to move until his vision almost went black before he passed out something slipped out of his mouth. Oh no. He saw Hitoshi turn, then darkness, so so dark. He could faintly hear yelling but it was warm and he liked it here. He liked the feeling of freeness. He forgot what was going on. Slowly the voices faded. He was swimming in the dark. The warmth enveloped him. It felt like he was being cradled. For the first time in his life his mind was quiet and he felt safe. But the feeling didn't last. Slowly it became more and more cold until he was freezing. Then pain. He was cold and in pain. It was lonely here. The dark was suddenly scary. He wished he could go back to the warmth but something told him he wasn't going back. His eyes felt like a billion tons of weight. He didn't like it. He couldn't open them but with each attempt they opened more until he finally opened them. Everything hurt. He looked around a bit. He was in a strange room. Itoshi said something. Pain covered his bond six but it was the worst in his abdomen. Izuku looked for the source of pain and saw he was in a hospital found. He was covered in bandages. I am such a failure. I couldn't keep Hitoshi away from my past. Now he is dragged in. I can't believe I passed out. I am such an idiot. This kept circling his mind. Only this. Then he felt his hand being squeezed. Things came back into focus. Hizashi and Hitoshi were on either side of him trying to calm him down. He blindly followed but was still nervous. They were going to be mad. He was weak and passed out. He caused them trouble. A nurse came in and put something into his IV. After a bit he felt the pain disappear. He relaxed. A short lady walked in. It took him to realize it was recovery girl. He liked her. She said something about healing him and needing his consent. He heard Aizawa say something. Izuku had to focus to lift his arms and sigh. Everything was ten times harder. Everything was fuzzy. He both liked it and didn't like it. Then the weirdest thing happened. The old lady kissed his forehead. All of a sudden his whole body was really heavy. His eyes closed and he was out. 
He woke up feeling better but he still felt foggy. He decided he didn't like it. Not everything was clicking in his mind. He took off the mask on his face. Food was placed in front of him. He was so hungry he hadn't raided in a while. How long has it been? He shoveled the food into his mouth. He wasn't full once he finished eating but it was better than before. He realized everyone was staring at him. He had eaten too fast. But then Hitoshi started laughing than Hizashi. It lightened the mood a bit but Izuku was still embarrassed. He felt less groggy. Looking at himself he noticed he was missing the blood tap. And there were less wires on him. Once you have been awake for a while we will have Chiyo come again to heal you again. Aizawa said. I know this may be a little soon but what happened? Hitoshi asked. Izuku didn't want to tell Hitoshi. He didn't want to tell him how weak he had been. He also didn't think he could get through the story without crying. He had promised not to cry in front of anyone. He was keeping that promise. Please Izuku we want to help. Hitoshi said. Izuku didn't raise his head he kept looking down and picking at his nails. Izuku you scared the crap out of me. The least you can do is tell me what the fuck happened to you. You came over to my house acting fine then all of a sudden collapsed. I watched as you bled out on the floor of my kitchen then had to watch as my pops tried to hold you closed while I talked to the operator then watched as you were rushed out of my house by paramedics. I think I deserve an explanation. Itoshi said with frustration in his eyes. As his son recounted the story he could see tears in his eyes. Izuku felt bad and was sorry but he couldn't talk. I thought you were going to die. I thought you were dead. Itoshi added. Izuku looked at Itoshi tears in his eyes. Damn it I am crying. I am so weak. I should have been able to take care of myself. I am a failure. Izuku signed before looking back down. He wiped his eyes making sure no tears fell. Itoshi got up and walked out of the room. I am such a failure. I am so weak. I can't even keep people from getting hurt. All I do is cause pain. Aizawa left. Hizashi sat there silently for a bit. Izuku kept his eyes on his nails. When Hizashi spoke Izuku jumped. Izuku, I understand if you are not ready to talk about what happened. That is completely understandable. You just went through something really traumatic and it's normal to not want to relive it right now. Itoshi is worried and wants to make sure you're okay. This doesn't mean you force yourself to talk about it. I do ask that at some point you tell either me or Aizawa what happened so we can help you. Hizashi said. Izuku asked. I think he is more frustrated and sad that you went through this. Izuku didn't know how to answer. He kept fiddling with his hands. Aizawa walked back into the room. Itoshi is just walking around. He is going to get some coffee. Aizawa sat down. Izuku signed without looking up. He knew he had asked the same question of Hizashi but Aizawa was just with him so he knew better. He isn't mad. He is frustrated. Give him a second and he should be okay. You aren't at fault. Take your time getting ready. I will ask that as a hero you talk to either me or Hizashi. I understand if you aren't ready to talk yet. Chio is on her way to heal you some more. Is there anything you want or need before you sleep again? Aizawa explained. Izuku understood what Aizawa was saying. When Aizawa asked if Izuku needed anything he realized he really had to go to the bathroom. He felt embarrassed asking but knew he had to. Izuku somehow turned more red. I will get a nurse to help you. Aizawa said then he walked out to get a nurse. Hizashi and Aizawa waited outside as Izuku was taken to the in-room bathroom. Hizashi came back in after he was back in bed. Aye, he went to get recovery girl. After a few minutes recovery girl and Aizawa walked in. Hello again young man. You look better than the last time I saw you. Recovery girl joked. I need to change your bandages and see your injuries. Do you want me to kick Hizashi and Aizawa out or can they stay? Izuku thought about it. He knew the amount of scars he had wasn't normal. He knew he would be seen as weak if they saw them. He didn't want them to see it. What would he do if Hitoshi walked in? The other part was he was pretty sure that Aizawa had seen his scars a while ago. He couldn't take the chance of Aizawa recognizing them. So he signed. Izuku looked sheepish. Of course little listener. Hizashi and Aizawa walked out of the room. Recovery girl followed them out then came back in with another nurse. They closed the door. Izuku was nervous. They had him take the top half of his hospital gown off and sit up so they could get the upper body injuries. The nurse and Chio started unwrapping the bandages. Izuku looked down at the wounds. There were still stitches. The wounds were mostly healed they were still a pretty deep but they were a lot better. He didn't like the face recovery girl made when she saw his scars. He pretended not to care. These are healing really nicely. I do have to look at your legs next. First I am going to take the stitches out then reward your bandages. Recovery girl and the nurse started to take out the stitches. He was bleeding again but recovery girl said it should start looking better almost the second she used her quirk. They re-wrapped his torso. The cuts on his arms were fine and didn't need bandages. So this part might be a bit uncomfortable but I need you to pull your gown hip enough so we can tend to your legs. Recovery girl said. Izuku obliged. The whole process repeated itself. She took out the stitches and cleaned them. All of this hurt but Izuku didn't care at this point he was so tired. His legs didn't need to be bandages so once she finished cleaning them she helped Izuku tie on the back of the hospital gown. 
He paid back down. I am so sorry this happened to you dear. You are so lucky to be friends with such a great family like them. She gestured to the family waiting outside. They want to help you. Don't shut them out over this. Both Aizawa and Hizashi are heroes they understand what you are going through. You are not weak. You are strong. Recovery girl said. She had read his mind. She kissed his forehead. The world went black. When Izuku woke up a lot started happening. He was getting ready to be discharged. And he was told he was staying at the Yamada Aizawa household for a bit. He wasn't excited. How is he supposed to parole? Then Aizawa said they were going to swing by his apartment. This scared Izuku. He realized then that all the first aid stuff was still all over his apartment. He couldn't avoid this. Maybe he could go up alone. He was given clothes to change into. While he changed he took off the bandages. He was sad to see more scars. He got dressed and walked out. Once the paperwork was done they all got into the car. Izuku got increasingly more nervous the closer they got to his apartment. He thought it would be fine but then everyone unbuckled their seatbelts when they parked. Izuku's blood went cold. Had he even put his vigilante stuff away? They got out of the car. Izuku tried to act normal. Izuku unlocked the door then opened it. There were bloody clothes on the floor. And first aid equipment. Hizashi audibly gasped. Izuku blushed. He hated how embarrassed he was about this. He walked into his apartment to start cleaning it up. Aizawa walked in too and helped. Izuku saw Hitoshi and Hizashi leave. There stayed Aizawa helping him. He was touching his bloody things cleaning them up. Izuku signed. It's fine kid you weren't expecting to have company. Will you tell me now what happened? Aizawa asked. Izuku signed as he chucked the clothes into his trash can. Izuku grabbed a bag from a by the door and started angrily shoving stuff into his bag. Aizawa went into the bathroom. Once Izuku had a few days of laundry he noticed Aizawa hadn't come back out of the bathroom. Izuku walked in to see Aizawa cleaning up blood off the floor. The stitching needle kit was still in the sink. He really had. He was so out of it when he stitched himself up that he didn't even notice he had left a bloody puddle. Aizawa grabbed Izuku's toiletries and passed them to him. Izuku put them in his bag. Aizawa shouldn't have to clean up your blood Izuku chastised himself then picked up the rest of the paper towels. When they walked down to the car Izuku saw Hitoshi trying to hide he had been crying. I can't even keep Hitoshi from hurting. I am such a shitty friend. I should have just died in that alley. This family is being so nice and all I have done is spit in their face. I don't deserve any of this. They got back into the car. The car ride was silent. They got to the house. They all got out. Hazashi showed Izuku to the guest room. Before Hazashi left Izuku signed. Of course, you know where the bathroom is. Hi. Hazashi nodded gave him a smile then left. Izuku had messed up. All he did was disappoint people. Sighing he grabbed a change of clothes and his shower stuff. He walked into the bathroom grabbing a spare towel the after a bit of struggle he turned the water on. While it was heating up he got undressed trying not to look at his body. He couldn't stand to see how weak and gross he was. His scars were disgusting. He doesn't remember taking a shower but he wakes up getting dressed. He wakes up a bit later at the kitchen table. Everyone is looking at him. He is dissociating. He picked up his hands. They were shaking. He tried to steady them but gave up because nothing was changing. Izuku paused. He was shaking all over. He was feeling the phantom pains. They were looking at him waiting. Izuku decided to finish the story so he could be done. Izuku didn't look up at the family. He was looking at his hands laid in his lap shaking. Everything on Izuku hurt. He could feel the sting of the blade on him. I want to start with thanking you for telling us. The second part. You in no way deserved that. You are a human being. Just like any of us. What they did was unlawful and horrible. Thirdly. I am so happy you came over and I am so thankful that you are okay and decided to keep fighting. You deserve so much more than life has given you. You are an amazing person. You are so nice and thoughtful. You are funny. But quirk is a tool it is not who you are. Izuku could hear the tears and anger in his ashes voice. Izuku looked up in shock. Aizawa was pissed but Izuku realized it wasn't aimed at him. Hitoshi looked angry. Hitoshi got up from his chair. He walked over next to Izuku. Can I hug you? Hitoshi asked. Izuku had never been asked before. Usually people just touched him and put their hands on him without asking. Izuku nodded. Hitoshi hugged him. Izuku hugged back. They stayed like this for a while. For once Izuku didn't feel so lonely. 